It is Tuesday, August 15th, 2023. We're on Monday Night Live, and we've got our usual crew, Julia Williams and Mike Gold, and we got some special guests coming through. So I guess off the top, you can tell if you're watching this that Mike Gold was not fired. Um, we talked about it a little bit uh, from the Cayman Islands. He had some personal things that he had going on in his life, really big plans. Basically, we got bumped um, in the priorities of his life. And so he couldn't make it, but it actually worked out great because at, with, without Mike here, obviously we lean heavily on him for a lot of analysis. Um, it forced us to basically just bring in a bunch of guests in the Cayman islands. And we did that. We had a bunch of guests on the show last week on Monday, definitely go back and listen to it. If you haven't, if you haven't, uh, till now, um, you know, we had Laura Estrella, Christine Castro, Sammy DePass, Khaled Usher, and Lane Norton on the show. We just posted it as a podcast. Um, so like on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, if you're subscribed to us there, you should be able to listen to the audio only version. And as soon as I'm off this um, this episode tonight, I'll post a higher quality video version on our YouTube as well. So definitely go and check that out. Make sure you're subscribing to our YouTube account so you never miss this. Make sure you're following us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America, and you'll never miss an update about when we're going to do these Monday night lives. But yes, I was flying back uh, from the Cayman Islands yesterday, basically all day. It was like a 12 hour situation for me. And I, we were thinking about trying to do it live from the airport, but just with the sketchy Wi-Fi and the, the noise, and then also with Julia and I just being absolutely busted from the Cayman Islands. I mean, from a super long week long of competition and, and hard work down, down there, uh, just wasn't going to be possible. So we decided, all right, let's push it to Tuesday night. So that's what we're doing. Like I mentioned at the top, but in case the live cut off, I'll mention again, we got Tristan Nazelrod stopping by. We got Alex Sador stopping by. We're going to be talking about all things NAPF, kind of a little mini NAPF recap show with Tristan Nazelrod, and then a mini uh, junior and sub-junior worlds preview show with Alex Sador. And just to keep you updated on everything that we got going on with Power Thing America, just don't forget, we've got high school nationals. The registration is open. That's April 19th in, in New Orleans next year. There's also a logo contest going on with that. All of the information is linked below. So if you want to, if you're a team out there, or if you're on a high school team, it's open to any athlete. You can, you can try to create a new logo for the competition. And if you do that, you'll get a free entry. You'll get a free t-shirt. We'll probably repost you. We'll maybe have an interview with you on the podcast, get to hang out with me on some zoom calls while we refine it and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So definitely go check that out. We also have uh, upcoming uh, announcement, uh, you know, competitions that we've announced. Bench Press Nationals, January January twenty seventh in Austin, Texas. That will be a qualifier for Bench Press Worlds, which we're also hosting May twenty fifth in Austin, Texas. So that's pretty huge. We've got a, a World Championships coming to the U.S. on U.S. So soil. Last week, if you were listening to Monday Night Live, we also had breaking news. We broke the dates that we literally got the dates like an hour before we went live on Monday Night Live for open classic nationals next year will be March 14, 15, 16 in Reno, Nevada. All I've, that's literally all the information that I have at this point is the date. And I've also heard that the venue is amazing. It was a, it was the venue that hosted USA weightlifting or no weightlifting world championships. Um, um, just this last year. So a, a, like a world-class level facility. And also with that, the last day, whatever ends up being the last day, kind of depends on how, how many people sign up. Um, is going to be university nationals. So that's a really cool idea. I think it's really cool that the university nationals athletes will be on the same stage and the same platform as our superstars in the open classic, uh, open classic nationals and, and in a great venue like that. And then the last thing is just to, to mention, to reiterate, we're just coming back from the North American power team championships in the Cayman islands. It was amazing. It was spectacular. It's a, all this camaraderie down the, in, in the North American championships. It's a lot of fun. We're going to be hosting that competition on U.S. soil in Scottsdale next year. So if you like what you saw this year from the North American Championships, just imagine it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Uh, Miriam Elm and Rodney Elm are going to be the actual meet directors who are hosting it down there. They just hosted the age group and equip nationals in that same exact venue in Scottsdale. So it's a great venue. We've been in there before. Tons of stuff to do around there. And it's one of the best competitions of the year. It's a really fun competition. So um, I'm hoping that it's definitely going to be bigger and better. We're going to get a lot more Americans there. We're going to get a lot more people from the other Central American countries and Canada, of course, as well. So it's going to be huge. All right. Any questions about that stuff? Um, Mike, is this the first time you're hearing about the situation in Reno, Nevada? Well, um, so I did listen to the entire thing last week. Um, so I did catch it at the end. But multiple people on uh, social media were not happy that... Uh, 
it took two hours in the podcast for some of the biggest, most important news for the Federation to uh, be spoken about. So wow, you're just gonna troll me like that, huh? You're gonna bring up you're gonna bring up some of the uh, negative uh, comments that were out there. Um, meanwhile, well, I, listen, I'm here to be the voice of the people. So I'm just saying what I heard other people <laughs> discussing. I personally, I, I didn't think it was a big deal because I assumed yeah. like you make a post, like you, you make a post, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah most so... people are not going to be catching it live, whether it's the first minute or later in the podcast. More people will see it when you put a post up. So I didn't think it was such a big deal, but well, I, I just saw people complaining about it. So I well, it it's interesting that those complaints really helped get the word out about it. Anyway, nonetheless, yeah, obviously they could have they could have made it uh, got the word out in a little more positive way. Maybe cut us a little slack, show a little bit of grace, um, given that we literally got the information an hour before we went live. We already had a bunch of guests lined up that were sitting there waiting, and then on top of that, um, basically everyone on our on our team on our EC. Um, including the person who signed the contract was there in the Cayman Islands coaching 104 athletes at a, one major international competition. Um, so there's certainly not time to make a post or anything official along those lines. And there still hasn't been because it was a grueling uh, week of competition in the North American championships. I mean, basically I was putting in 14, 15 hour days. Our coaching staff was starting at 6 AM and ending at 11 PM every night. So, I mean, it was just absolutely grueling trying to coach 104 athletes in a matter of four, four, five days of competition, it's really tough. And then obviously there's a lot of details that are, I still don't even have the details. Um, like how do you qualify? How do you qualify for the U S national team next year? What's the selection process going to be for U S national obvious questions that if you make a post like that, that you need to have answers for. So we don't have those answers. So we just want to get the information out there. And obviously we want to push Monday night live and the power of the America podcast is where we're going to be able to release breaking news as it happens. So like I said, happened to run into Tamara Lopes and she happened to give me that information just literally, you know, right before we went live. Um, so we got it out there as best we could. Of course, yeah. you know, some people in the sport don't want to cut power in America, any slack, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're small fed Our basically our whole team is down there. So, uh, I'm not in any way ashamed of how we did it. And I think we got the information out there and that's, that's a good thing. And obviously our, our responsibility, especially for our coaches is not to be making, you know, posts about something that's happening almost a year in advance. Um, it's to be coaching the athletes, the 104 athletes that they have right in front of them competing that week. So that's definitely the priority. But now that we're back, I think most of our team is getting back yesterday and today. And then, um, you know, some of us like, including Tamra and including a lot of other people on our team are going to Romania in a week, but hopefully in this week, we can get some answers on some of the de finer details, make an official post somewhere. So, but yeah, that's the story on that. Mike, any further ideas, thoughts on that? Yeah. So either way, just on a positive note, um, I yeah. really like the idea of having the university nationals in the same place the day after. I think it's just a very good experience for any of the college lifters, like junior age lifters who um, hope, who either think that hopefully in the future they're going to be like at that top level open lifter or either way, just to be able to compete um, in the same place as all the top open lifters. And if they get there early, they get to they get to watch open nationals, they get to meet all those lifters. So I think it's always a cool experience to do that rather than completely separating it. So I like that. Yeah. And um, let's remember to try and ask Alex Sador about it because he, him and Carolyn competed at open nationals this year as juniors. And we can kind of get a sense, you know, I think it's a really cool concept of where our, our nationals are now that we can have juniors and sub juniors competing and masters competing in with the open division. And then we can also now have the university nationals on that same platform and they can come hang out and watch all these battles that we are going to be talking about. We don't want to go into the details too much, but there's going to be, it's, uh, open classic nationals is going to be massive next year. So yeah, it'll be really fun for them to come out, have a good reason to come out and watch that stuff in person. So, all right. Any other thoughts on that stuff? Julia, do you have anything? Um, no, just, I mean, like, like you said, it was, it was wild. Um, I think when did we get done that, that, that podcast? It was like three hours long. We got done at like 11 PM. Yeah. Oh, I mean, later. there was, virtual, yeah. Yeah. And then we were, we were up at six the next morning for weigh-ins and stuff. I mean, and then just super long days. It's hard to get stuff done when you, when you're doing that kind of stuff. Um, so definitely 
you know, like I said, responsibility to the athletes that are there in front of us that being to coach and on our side to, to cover their competitions, um, as opposed to making announcements and things like that, which, like I said, we don't even have all the information on our side, um, to make an announcement. Well, and also like some of those, like there were multiple athletes in like, um, each flight, both like all of the days. And sometimes there were, there were up to three flights. So, and also because it is like mixed with masters and, um, open and juniors kind of in the same session um there are yeah three sessions per day um it all the coaches are back there all the time it's it's um like none of them had any downtime it's not like they had like one session of masters and then one session of open like before me um the 63 69 juniors and masters were lifting and then i was like the next flight and then it started all over again. So there's free time for anything to to be done. Really. It was tough. It was crazy, Mike. Um, you can only imagine like you were in Malta when we had 16 athletes, we had 104 men and in Malta, we, you know, we had those 16 athletes spread across more days. Um, here we had 104 crammed in five days. It was, it was wild. It was definitely the, the most and most difficult job I've ever done as far as just trying to cover them and just be standing on my feet and running around like crazy, like I do at competitions, um, for all of them and trying to show them all love. And it's, you know, obviously we make mistakes and it, we're, we're definitely fallible, but, um, we definitely, we definitely tried our hardest. And anyway, we will get out, we will get an announcement out for now. People can mark their calendars. They know the dates, they know that the venue is going to be good. And you know, it's going to be stacked to the brim with loaded competition. So that's about all you really need to know at this point. There's plenty of time to settle out the rest of the details. As soon as there's a link for registration, we'll post that. As soon as there's a, a page up on the website where you can have the registration information, hotel information, all that kind of stuff, we'll post that for sure. So, all right, let's go ahead and get into then our North American Championships sort of recap. Um, we're going to bring in Tristan here in just a bit. I'm expecting him to be here like in probably the next five minutes. But before that, let's just go ahead and do like a quick, like overall summary of what happened to start off with. It was the biggest North American championships ever, 280 athletes from 14 countries. We had a good, huge squad, 104 athletes, like we mentioned, all age groups. And as we mentioned in the preview article that Julia and Amy Hutchison wrote, we had uh, 17 former world champions there. Also, so uh, getting into the results, the U.S. swept the team awards in all four open categories, classic men and women, equipped uh, men and women. The U.S. also won seven best lifter awards out of 15, which also shows that, you know, seven out of 15 is good, but it's not uh, a absolute sweep or anything. So, so it shows that there are some great lifters from this region. In fact, the highest good lift points of anyone there was Caf Kaf- from Canada on the men's side and Sammy DePass on the women's side. Um, for for us, the highest good lift points was Philip Trong, the Trongster, um, as we call him, you know, because he's a monster. And uh, he had the highest good lift points of any American with 100.7. And if you do the age-adjusted IPF good lift points, John Laflamme had the highest with 128.7. That's a whopping score, a 128.7. And Gail Williams had a 115.7 on the women's side. So those are huge numbers. Um, Amy Hutchison actually made a post today that I happened to come across that said uh, that the U.S. team won, uh, broke 15 world records, 54 NAPF records, 56 first place finishes, 24 second place finishes, and 11 third place finishes. I'm not sure about that information. I have not verified it, but either way, even if it's remotely close, remotely accurate, um, that's, that's great. I mean, that's a ton. I mean, and so people talking about wanting to have a competition where you have a chance to go and show off that isn't the world championships. This is that meet where you can go and break world records. You can break North American records. You can go up against stars in the sport, like Kafwi and Sammy, um, from other countries like Bryce Krawcheck, Eric Willis, these kind of people. So, and then of course you can support the region and help grow the sport in all these other countries so that they come up as well. Um, cause we, we had great performances by Costa Rica, um, and Puerto Rico had great performances, Mexico, um, Nicaragua had, had some superstars on the equip side. So it was a really cool competition overall. Um, each, at, each evening, the atmosphere was just absolutely electric. So there was always a session that was kind of in the evening, like six o'clock start time. And it was just absolutely packed in there. It was a small room. So it felt super close and tight and, and super loud. Um, so yeah, the Jonathan Garcia, Dalton Lacoste session 
was packed right from the beginning. That was the first day. Uh, the Luella session, which also included Claire and Melissa Copeland and Lillian Jackson in these two fights. I mean, they were all breaking world records. Like Melissa Copeland broke a world record. Lillian Jackson broke a world record. Claire was in an epic battle with Sammy. Um, and Christine Castro was in that. Uh, also, our super good friend from the Dominican Republic, the queen of the Dominican Republic, the Amanda Lawrence of the DR, uh, Laura Estrella was in that session as well. So it was just like an absolutely popping session. It was great to see. Of course, the Battle of the 120s. You had not only the Battle of the 120s, but you had Ray Williams making his international platform debut in there. And that was definitely by far the most packed and stacked session, um, the loudest for sure brought down the house. And on the last day, Manolo Campos attempted a huge squat on the equipped side, also a huge bench, you know, that was the electrifying for the crowd as well. Um, on our end, we've got tons more media coverage coming. As I said, you know, just being able to run around and film all 104 athletes was a struggle in and of itself. So obviously editing all that footage and getting it posted, um, there's tons more to do in the next coming days. So um, also, again, it, we have that Monday Night Live from last week. You can see some interviews with some of these people that are really the heart and soul of the North Americans, um, the North American region. And so definitely go check that out. But um, all right, with that, let's go ahead and bring in the reigning 120 kilo national champion and also now the 120 kilo North American champion, and that is Tristan Nasalrod. Oh, what's up, man? Yeah. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for having me. Of can you, you hear me all right? Yeah, we all can right. hear you. Good stuff. So uh Tristan's internet is notoriously slow <laughs> from our, our previous podcast. So we'll see how it goes. But yeah, it sounds like there's a little bit of a delay, but it should be all good, man. Um, first of all, congratulations um on your huge win at the north american championships in the 120 kilo open class you're now the reigning national champion and the reigning um north american champion and you've now like defeated some superstars i mean you've beaten enrique lugo you've beaten mike t twice you've beaten bryce krawcheck so how does it feel man you're beating kaylin from Braz from belize right can't leave him out because he's a stud too so how's it feel for sure Oh, it feels great. I mean, anytime you go down and kind of execute on a plan and things fall into place how, how you want them to, that always feels good. I know I I knew this competition was going to be tough. Like you said, all, all three of those guys that you named, any one of them could have had a day and come out with a win. So to be able to kind of control what I can and, and take home the gold for the day. I was definitely happy. All right, great. So we want to open it up to questions from Mike and Julia and myself. So let's first start with just kind of going through your experience uh, with the North American championships. And then we'll get into some more general talk about some of the other cl weight classes and some of the other battles and things like that, that we saw down there. Yeah, that sounds great. So first, why don't you just go ahead and take us through the day, um, how it started off um, with, with the squat? Yeah, um, I, I would say, so my approach for this meet was to whittle down my body weight even more than I had prior to nationals. And I would say for the past several years, I've been just like slowly getting lighter and lighter before the actual competition to the point where this time I only had to cut about three to three and a half kilos the week before. And that's compared to like nationals, I was cutting about five kilos. And nationals the year before this year, I cut six to six and a half. So it's just like slowly narrowed. And what I felt like has happened is I can get momentum earlier in the day. My squats, because normally how it w would work is I would start to feel the water getting back into my system by the time I hit the platform for squats. And then by the time squats were over, I was starting to feel a little bit more like myself. This time around, I just felt good starting from warm-ups, and it, it carried through, you know. I felt like on a very good day, that North American record was going to be there with 355 and a half. And that's exactly what we had, loaded it up, and dare I say there was a little bit left in the tank. You you may say, bro, you may say, because, yeah, it moved, <laughs> it moved. Um and, and man, you were, you were so hyped for it. I wonder if there's a little bit of like, just uh, one thing you can't account for is just the adrenaline, right? Like 
I mean, like you got, it moved faster probably than you expected. I maybe just chalk it up for adrenaline. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I'm one of those people and I, I would never suggest this to anyone probably, but like I train very mellow. So like, I don't do any of the hype stuff in training. I just kind of do my job. And then on meet day, I crank it up to 11 and (laughs) I tend to feel like there's a little bit of a a carry over there to my lift. For sure. Mike or Julia, you got any questions about the squat? Yeah, I would just say, um, you said like there, there might've been a little bit left in the tank, uh, watching it like on, on the screen, uh, it seemed like there definitely was a little bit more. Um, I saw when, (laughs) when you uh, did that 750 squat, like uh, two weeks out or something, it was like a week or two out, I guess that moves really well. Yeah. Two weeks out. Two weeks out. Okay. So I, I was thinking if possible, like it, 800 looks like it's, it's like getting, it's like close. And then that third attempt, like there, there was, I don't know. I don't know how many kilos. I don't know if it was 10 kilos or whatever. Oh, we're getting this clipped. Okay. You can, um, you can go ahead. You yeah. can keep oh, talking. There we go. Keep talking yeah, over so, it. I'm going to just play Tristan's yeah, I mean, video. The, the, op- the opener was a warm up. <laughs> that was, mm-hmm. and then we get to the third attempt and you load the NAPF record and, I mean, obviously you were trying to make sure you were three for three on squats and like get a big lead after squats because you were in like a, I mean, there were four like top level competitors in your class, which is like pretty amazing that we're at NAPFs and there's four, I think all four of you would have totaled, like would have been, um, would have been in prime time at worlds, all four of you, I'm pretty sure. So like yeah. we're literally getting, we're literally getting a battle of like, not just people like world level competitors, but like the top half of the world level competitors. So I think, I mean, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. And you, you kind of nailed it there. I, there were a couple variables coming in with training where, like I said, I was kind of whittling my body weight down as training was happening leading in. And you get that little bit of a, leverage difference like you can tell there's a little less of you underneath the bar when you're squatting whenever you're losing weight and i just think i was getting used to that so that 750 squat that you were talking about like it's kind of funny to hear your outside perspective that you were thinking oh 800 may be there it felt not great in in my like head And that was just mostly because leverages were a little bit different. I remember the squat before that 750, 720 moved very slow. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, this should be an opener-ish on game day. And then I hit the 750, convinced myself it moved fast enough. And it it certainly did, watching back. Um, And whenever we get to meet day, I... I had an idea the number was going to be around 350 kilos or that 355 and a half. The the main benefit of that 355 and a half was the chip. And as you were talking about with top level competitors, if you can get that half kilo onto your total to make someone possibly take an extra two and a half kilos somewhere to try and jump it, that can be a a huge advantage. So whenever I talked to Rodney Elm, who was the the head coach of the U S team down there, uh, we basically said, Hey, there may be more, like there's a chance I smoke my second and there's more than three fifty five and a half and a half there, but it doesn't make any sense to like try and stretch it any more than we have to. Let's take that 0.5 and kind of, get that momentum rolling in the right direction. Now, the last thing I'll say is because uh, training was kind of held back a little bit with that weight loss coming in, my plan now is to kind of maintain myself at like 123 all the way until nationals. I'm going to have six months to get used to those new leverages. And that's where I think things can hopefully get exciting as far as numbers go. Oh, yeah. so that's that's a very interesting point because you find you see most a lot of lifters, um, especially the highest level ones, are cutting, let's say, 
like three, three 3% of their body weight or something like that, like a water cut. But, um, obviously the advantage mm -hmm. of doing the cut beforehand where you're not cutting from like 124 the night before is that you don't have to worry about recomp. I mean, you don't have to worry as much about recomp and stuff because you're just doing a small water cut, but you you're thinking about staying at a light body weight, like throughout where you really just don't have, it's really not a factor. Yeah. And, and really it's probably just a rebound from where I, I did exactly what you were talking about to the point where, you know, like in 2019, where things really hit ahead for me being way too heavy. Um, I was 10 kilos over five days out and I was water cutting those 10 kilos and it was absolutely miserable. And it wasn't that my performance suffered that much, but it was like so miserable leading in that like mentally there's a switch you have to turn on. That's like, I feel terrible, but I'm going to be okay on meat day. Whereas this kind of new approach is more of like a gradual, just continuation of momentum. There's no dip anywhere. And I've really enjoyed that the week of. That's exciting, man, because, um, you're obviously already putting up big totals, but just to think about where the future, when you keep this strategy going for the future, what it, what it may hold for you, Julia, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I saw, you know, my, uh, to share was called for, I believe it was depth. I'm not, I'm not quite sure on his first squat. Um, how much were you paying attention to that? I mean, I know like I have a similar, um, I'm in a similar situation to you where I came in a little bit lighter and so my leverages were different. Did that, um, did that get into your head at all? Um, you know, with the slight leverage change and, and everything or was, or were you not really paying attention? Um, so as far as the day of with leverages, I, I would say that was out of my mind completely. It didn't bother me at all. Um, looking at these warmups, these are as good as they felt in years so i definitely had nice momentum going into that that first lift now i was kind of forced into watching mike's first attempt because i was the lifter after him so like i'm in the on deck circle and i just happened to catch the lights it it wasn't like i was looking at his attempt or trying to figure out what happened um but I just kind of saw it by proxy. Now, when something like that happens, and in my mind, my competitors are out of my control. Mike, Bryce, Kalen, all three of the guys, like you said, they're world-class lifters. I expect them to execute on every single lift. So to me, I just, in my head, have it set that they're going to make all of their lifts and I'm going to have to make all of mine. And then whoever's strongest is going to win. Now seeing someone have a technical mishap like that. And like looking back, Mike crushed that squat. He told me himself, he felt like he cut it a little bit and you know, those things happen just little mental errors. But in the moment, there is a little bit of momentum to be had. Like, I, part of me wants to tell you that I don't care at all, right? And they do their things. But whenever you see a competitor miss a lift, there is a little bit of a feeling of like, okay, this is my chance. Like, the door is open. I have to go execute. And that just kind of feeds momentum into you. Now, I don't know how you all feel as competitors as well. I'd be curious to find that out yeah julia what do you think about that do you watch and do you see what if your competitors are missing or not yeah i mean i have i'm such a bad habit of worrying way too much about my competitors I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh especially at this competition julia you were very concerned yeah. well yeah i i mean i think in a case like tristan's where i'll say this um I think that my competitors were a lot closer to me than what was portrayed um, at the meet um, on the platform. And it, you know, maybe they took a few too many warm ups or maybe some dis 
advantageous attempts, whatever. Um, but when you're in a situation like Tristan is where everyone knows exactly what they're doing, they're doing, they've been doing this for years. Um, it's a really different situation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I worry about that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bad habit. And the more you can, can not do that, the, the better. Just so, just for reference, Julia won by like 27 and a half kilos. She won her weight class, uh, the 63 open and her biggest competitor was Pamela Santos from Panama who missed her third squad and missed her third bench. So Julia, at that time, were you aware that she had missed those lifts? Yeah. I mean, I was actually focused on the, the, um, Trinidadian girl because she opened the same as me and her squats were looking really strong. Um, and she was taking big jumps, but then I noticed that they both missed their attempts. Um, and it did, it did help a little bit, but you know, I'm not the best deadlifter and, uh, <laughs> you never know what happens. You, you never know what can happen going into deadlifts. I think Tristan had a similar situation with yeah. uh, Mike you pulling for like a world record or something crazy. I mean, it was out of reach, you know, by that time, but you know, you, you just never know. It's, it's, it's nice to know you have a cushion, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, the same thing could happen to you and at the next, the next lift. And it's like, yeah. So you, um, you're talking about the Trinidadian girl. Yes. Yeah, she opened 150, same as you jumped to 160 and missed it twice. Um, and then she missed a third bench as well. And, you know, by that, by the time she missed 160 twice and you, you did hit 155 and then 160, you went eight for eight and only missed your final, final pull. So, you know, you applied a lot of pressure and, um, you know, got the, got the dub and it, and you, you, it, it's true though. She was very concerned in the warm up room, um, before everything started about it, but, you know, put, put aside the nerves and went out there and handled business. But that was a good, that was a really good insight between the two uh, best lifters on this podcast. I don't know, Mike Gold, what's your take? Well, you, you already know, I get into <laughs> trouble. I, I root against my competitors. Oh so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mike Gold is the absolute, like r- most ruthless competitor. Go ahead and say, give your take on that. <laughs> you're the, uh, assuming you're in a situation where you have a ch- chance of winning, you're there to win and winning, obviously in an ideal world, you win because you hit nine lifts and they hit nine lifts and you're stronger, but sometimes you're not stronger. And you, if your goal is to win, then your goal is to win, regardless of how that happens. So, yeah, I, I straight up root against them. So <laughs> he, he's putting it very lightly. He, I think in the past on this podcast, he said something along the lines, he wants them to fail uh, for sure. Yeah, uh, he I'm, saying, he, I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm rooting for them to fail and I'm clapping when they fail. <laughs> we, we call this. So the, if I could... I, sorry, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Tristan. No, you're good. Um, uh, I was just gonna say, if I could jump in, I feel like that's a uh, that is one hundred percent reasonable. And even though I'm not someone who's going to outwardly <laughs> clap, um, I think the competitor in us, um, whether we like it or not, there's probably a little bit of relief, or like like I said, there's that momentum built. Like you can build your own momentum by making lifts, but you can also have momentum built by your competitors missing lifts. So, yeah. you know, you being so outward about that, it, it's hilarious, but it's mostly hilarious because I think a lot of us might think that way and maybe just not say it. So, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You, everyone feels a sigh of relief when their competitor misses something. They're not like, oh, damn, that really sucks. I wanted to beat them when, at their best when it's close and you might lose. Well, except for uh, the people that clap when they're a uh, lifter hits to win it, you can clap them on if they win but inside you're probably thinking damn i wish they would have missed but julia what were you going to add to that no i'm just saying um you know this the napf is like nicknamed the friendship cup and we're out here like hoping our competitors miss but it's <laughs> it, it is what it is like if you can't if, if you know that you're not the stronger lifter and you want to win then you know <laughs> there's there's yeah. only one way that that's going to be accomplished so and yeah. julia definitely was not clapping uh for her competitors especially you know from these other countries but in our case here we had our two boys they're both americans they're in a battle it, it's been hyped forever so they know they're going head to head they're they're friends in real life um it's good sports it's good it's it's actually 
you know, taking your, your competitors seriously and, and showing them that respect by really doing whatever it takes to, to get the dub. So I think that's a really cool approach. All right. What else? Anyone else have any other uh, question, any comments or anything, questions for Tristan about how he was feeling going into the squad? You want to say anything else? Go ahead, Tristan. Yeah, I had one more thing just to go off of what Julia said that I think is a good point. Um, so like comparing those squad attempts, you know, I, I'll be mistaken maybe here. I think you said she went uh, 150, 155, 160. Yeah. And then the competitor went 150, 160, miss, miss. Yes. Looking as a coach or a spectator or even a lifter who's like following the numbers in the back there, that might look like your competitor was in a stronger position because a second attempt was 160, which was five kilos higher than your second attempt. But and it would be so easy to fall into that trap of like chasing your competitor's attempts. And it sounds like you didn't do that. You kind of played your game. And all of a sudden, you go from second attempts, they're in this five kilo projected lead, to after third attempts, the tables have completely turned and you have a 10 kilo lead. So that's like 15 kilos worth of total that has swung just in attempt selection. Yeah. And we've seen this now. Um, we saw it with Natalie Richards and Jod Jacob, you know, Nat, uh, Jod had a huge nominated total advantage or a huge, uh, op- advantage on openers. And then Natalie ends up winning pretty handily, you know, same thing here. Um, so yeah, good, really good points on that. You can't chase, you got to do your thing. And you both were handled by Rodney Elm, right? So, <clears throat> so he, he also coached y'all to make the right attempts. Um, especially, um, you know, on, in Julia's case, he's a, such a calming presence, um, on Tristan's case, he didn't do a whole lot to hype you up, but he didn't really need to, cause you were hyping yourself up like a maniac. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's not much left to be said on that. <laughs> For sure. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on into the bench press then. And while you're take us in, unless anyone had anything else, um, and take us through, the bench press and i will uh play the video while you're talking as well julia do you have something sorry real quick before oh, no, i'm trying to pull down the the screen so i can access the um i'm trying to get out of full screen mode so that i can access the um okay all right the, so you figure that um i got it i got it yeah so uh so steven crane who is in the chat right now he's the live stream commentator that you that commentated all pretty much the whole thing. He also hats off to him, by the way, was one of these people yeah. like myself and Mike Z that were there for, and, and a lot of our coaching staff that were there for every single session, every single flight, all the way through like this grueling schedule. It was absolutely crazy, but he pulled it off. He said, it's interesting that Mike is uh, Bryce's coach and that they're going head to head too. Yeah, definitely. We can, we can talk about that a little bit as we go through um, because I definitely saw I was looking for that. I took some pictures of them in the same frame, kind of facing each other and, and facing in different directions from each other, you know, and then also some pictures of some video where one would Bryce would be walking off and you get a little fist bump from Mike T there, you know, but also not many words were spoken. So it was very interesting to see the, these three guys that are all friends in such an epic battle, but okay. So take us through your bench and I'll, I'll play the bench video while you're talking. Yeah. So I, Bench, honestly, was the pressure point, in my opinion, going in. Um, I, one, felt like I underperformed on bench so much from nationals. I was still kind of bitter about that miss. So that was some motivation. But kind of looking at the other lifters, kind of what I expect, and I'll use Mike as a great example, right? So I... I out squat Mike by a significant margin, right? So I think I gained like a 37 and a half kilo lead after squats. And then he out deadlifts me by a significant margin, right? So it it's funny because those are our two best lifts, but we kind of cancel each other out. And then we're left with the lift that both of us are, I think we would agree, um, the it's our lesser lift. We'll put it that way. Right. And that, but 
because of that, whoever outbenches the other person has a great advantage. And that's really where the kilos could be added on. So for me, and this was the main reason for cutting down my body weight because bench overall is most affected by those changes in leverages. Um, I was able to have a more consistent bench leading up to this competition. And this 217 and a half was the first time I'd hit a, a PR at 120 since uh, 2018 or 2019. <laughs> so uh, it was really nice just to go three for three and kind of build that subtotal, like Julia said. I knew I was going to be in a position where I'm just sitting and watching them pull uh, giant numbers after I'm done. So yeah, it went really well. Nice. Anyone have any questions here on bench? Uh, we're just taking a look here at that third attempt and it moves really nice, man. I mean, again, looks like there yeah. might be some extra kilos there. What do you think, Mike Gold? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Um, you hit the 475 in the gym with like moving mm -hmm. well and then this moved like similarly like looked more like a second attempt but like looking through the numbers at the time and then again i re-looked through the numbers by the time you got to the third bench with with mike missing his um opening squat and then missing his third bench and then um just at the numbers after bench just going three for three on bench really put you in position that it would take something like near impossible for somebody to catch up. Meaning you had such a big subtotal lead by the time, by the time you got through your third bench that even though you had both uh, Bryce and Mike T who are both, both capable of pulling for the deadlift world record. I mean, Mike pulled for it and missed, but like Bryce previously owned it. I'm saying these are two of the best deadlifters in the class, but even with that, they still weren't within reach. So I guess, that's where it comes down to just executing the game plan. I assume you had like basically what your bench attempts would be and you stuck to it and they moved well, like similar to squats. And then by the time you got finished with that, the other competitors didn't necessarily have the first six lifts that they wanted. And you basically were already had it locked up. Well, yeah. And that's, that's um... go ahead, Tristan. Oh uh, yeah. That's just a great example. So um, my bench game plan going in was um, 205, 212 and a half, and then 220 on a good day. But I, I knew my personal record was 217 and a half. And also knowing that there were some missed lifts by my other competitors going into that third bench, walking off after the second bench attempt, that's where... Um, I, me and coach Rodney Elm kind of made the call, Hey, let's take the more conservative third bench, take almost like a guaranteed five, basically, rather than risking a seven and possibly missing it, um, to, like you said, kind of lock down that giant subtotal lead. I, I think a less experienced self, you know, maybe five years ago, I would have said, Hey, let's go for 220. That's what I think is there on the day. And if something goes wrong, then all of a sudden I'm in a scrap deadlifting against the two best deadlifters in the world or two of three best deadlifters. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's a little bit of strategy there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. I always, I always try to tell people they don't always listen that especially when you're ahead, like never sacrifice, let's say five or seven and a half for the extra two and a half. Like people will be like, should I jump seven and a half or 10? Like, don't, if you're not sure about that last two and a half, don't sacrifice all the kilos, especially when you're in the prime position. If you just hit your lifts and take, you might leave two and a half on the table, but the bottom line is if you're in the position that you are and you make your lifts, you're forcing everyone else to get way out of line to try to catch up. So. Yeah, exactly. I think, um, because I made a post on this in the middle of the meet, um, I, I posted a video on the Instagram story of Mike T hitting his last warm up on deadlift. And it was a big pull in the, in the back room. And I said, he's 53 kilo. I think it was 53 kilos behind or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but he's not out yet because I had heard rumors that he was going to be trying to pull for the deadlift world record. 
And you just never know with these big deadlifters. And obviously I'm not really like looking at the board very closely and it's Mike T, you know, and, and also the other thing I would say is I did notice that you were cramping or at least you were getting work done on your back, like in between, uh, I think after squat and after bench, um, I saw Rodney over there, like, you know, pressing on you or using the, the vibration gun. And obviously you were doing your signature, uh, French's mustard eating, uh, <laughs> in between as well. So I figured, you know, maybe that was just, yeah. so t- tell us a little bit how you were feeling as far as, was there any issues with cramping or anything like that? Uh, no, it was actually pretty preventative. So I'm notorious for cramping kind of between my lats and low back whenever I bench. And most of my missed bench attempts tend to be because I cramp in the middle of them in that sticking point. So the massage gun uh, tends to relieve that, but only for a short period of time. So um, mm-hmm. I just told him, hey, work on my back between each of them, no matter how I'm feeling. That way I don't cramp up and regret not doing it basically. So um, fortunately it wasn't playing a big role in the moment, but you know, it's one of those things you have to take into account. I still did water cut that three kilos. So getting everything back in was a priority and same thing with the, the mustard, you know, trying to prevent as much cramping as possible on the day of. So you, at this point in the comp, like I said, you're ahead by 50 kilos. You've hit a squat PR, I believe. Correct. Pretty nice one too. Um, looks like maybe like, four, yeah, like seven eight kilos. kilos or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And then you're, you put up a bench that I think was just two and a half before, below your best. So you're having yourself a hell of a day here, right? Is that, yeah, I, your numbers yeah, right? I mean, uh, I would dare to say perfect day. Um, the bench, even though it was two and a half kilos below my best, that best was hit at a 132 kilo body weight. So oh, um, it was a two and a half kilo PR as a 120. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So a couple of PRs, you're probably feeling pretty good. Take us into the strategy and, and the how deadlift unfolded. Yeah. So pretty much I, I pulled Rodney aside. And we talked after bench and I just said, hey, you put on whatever we need to pull. to to win and I'll go do it, right? Uh, Total faith in him to call the numbers. Basically, I only plan two deadlift attempts with my coach, Bill McCarthy, shout out to him. Um, You know, we talked over the phone. I like big 20 kilo jumps usually. So we did 320, 340, and then we don't plan a third really. It's essentially what needs to go on the bar for the win. Now, it was one of those weird situations where after the second attempt, things seemed like they were going to be locked up. I know, I knew Mike was going to have to try a 393 kilo deadlift to get into that gold medal position after the second attempt. And, uh, you know, I told Rodney after, because long story short, I, I missed the third attempt and it's been haunting me ever since. Uh, I'll talk about why here in a second. But afterwards, I was like, hey, if Mike pulls 393, he deserves this gold medal. <laughs> like, um, Because we were set up in such a, a good position, and that would be such a massive pull. Um, now, going back to knowing where your competitors are, and this is something that I need to learn from, and I certainly will. If you watch on this deadlift here, it doesn't really show it here, but on the replay, you'll see it. Uh, I covered it up. Great. Um, Whenever I grab the bar with my left hand, the bar starts to roll away from me in a divot right right there. You see it. Yep. It starts starts to roll. And I was uh, basically, this was, this is ego, right? So what I should have done was recognize it started rolling, took a step back, reset myself and done the whole setup over again, because I would have had time. But in the moment, I saw it rolling and I said, oh, it's okay, I'll roll it back into me. But whenever I did that, I missed time sitting down into the bar because normally I set my bar over two laces. We just lost you for a second. Let's let's reset it. Let's reset it there. 
um, Tristan is talking about the this final deadlift here. And if you watch on this next replay, you'll see as it comes forward right here, we're watching it closely. He bumps the bar and it just takes a little roll forward right there and that's it. And he tries to roll it back and that's what he's talking about. So Tristan, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute again here. Cause we were just cut. You were just totally cutting out. We couldn't hear you. Now it looks like you might be frozen, but okay. Julia, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I do have something to say about that because um, I had a similar thing happen to me, not not quite the same, but the bar, when I came out, I think it was my first or um, and my second, I'm not quite sure, but it was crooked and I tried to roll it back into place before I set up and it wouldn't go back into place. Like it was still crooked um, orientated to, to, to the platform. So I felt like I was pulling diagonal. Um, so, um, I, I kind of noticed that too. I don't know if that was like the um, the platform itself or, you know, what was going on or it was just, you know, the same thing where, you know, the adrenaline just kicks in. Um, but I, I had a situation, a similar one. And um, luckily, I mean, I was able to open very light and uh, it wasn't so much of a problem for me. Um, but I noticed that on, I think I lifted on day two. So um, that was already kind of an issue at that point. Yeah. And Tristan, I think I think that you said that you actually hit the bar with your foot, with your shin, and that's what pushed it forward. It wasn't that it just rolled kind of like randomly. Maybe it was, it was kind of on an edge of a, a divot or something where just a little touch made it roll. But what is that? What were, is that what you were saying, Tristan? Are you back? Looks like Tristan is. Uh, delay he, he's he's fr still frozen so it's okay tristan i'm gonna just hit mute on you and then just unmute yourself whenever you're back um your, your video is frozen and your audio is not coming through but um all right so julia and mike let's mike what's your analysis of this overall um session here with the 120s so i mean for me this is definitely the session i was most looking forward to um but like we were saying when we were going over this like lift by lift through squat bench where for it to be the session, like, like the session where everyone's battling for gold, people had to all make their lifts because especially as we get to the heavier weight classes where people are taking potentially 15 to 20 kilo jumps, you miss one lift on squat, you miss a 20 kilo jump or you miss your opener and have to retake it. Right. That's 15 to 20 kilos on your total. And if the other lifters now don't miss their lifts, it's almost impossible to make that up. You're not, you're not missing like a five kilo jump from your second to third squat and like a low, lower weight class here, 20 kilos. It's very, if you're trying to make up 20 kilos from lifters who are either stronger or like same strength region as you, it's going to be almost impossible. So it comes down to executing and at one miss lift and it basically, I mean, it basically ends of the day. Absolutely. I mean, it was super close. I mean, in the end, actually, Tristan ended up running away, running away with this, um, you know, ends up winning by what is it? 23, 20, 27 kilos, something like that. That's a pretty yeah. big win. That but number's a like, little skewed because um, Mike pulled for the world record and took yeah. a big jump there. But like, if you watch his second squat, right. Or his third squat, which was really his second squat, um, like he had more there, right? Obviously he had more. He was opening with 300. It wasn't, it wasn't opening at 300 to end at 317. Um, so I don't know what exactly the plan, like, I don't know if he was planning on, let's say 300, 317, 330. I don't know exactly, but like, let's just say like if the third attempt was supposed to be like in the 327, 330 range, if he has 10 to 12 kilos more on squat, then all of his other attempts change, right? Now, now on deadlift, he doesn't need a load 386 he can load i mean obviously other things change for other people also but the point is like he'd be in a in in a region where he's pulling i mean he didn't even attempt to pull for the win because it was out of reach but if he makes three squats and makes three, three benches which he didn't make three squats or three benches now now he can pull let's say 375 for the win maybe and 375 that's a reasonable deadlift that's something that might be in the tank so missing missing lifts at that level when when um when you're taking that big jumps and it's that close basically kills it i do i do want to say one thing real quick too because after 
after that, like, as you said, there wasn't really a battle for first place. Um, there was a battle for the podium, though. And yes. it got pretty crazy at the yeah, end. Yeah, it did. With those three lifters being being quite close to each other, I, I think uh, the lifter from Belize was only um, five kilos behind Bryce or something like that. Um, yeah, he he yeah. ended up he ended yeah. up losing by five kilos, uh, Kalen, and he went three for three on deadlifts, and Bryce missed his third. So there was some drama there, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Tr and Tristan. Was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Are you back? Yeah, I come back. I'm hearing you all pretty well can you hear me fine yeah there's like it looks like like a three second delay but we got you go ahead Just tell us what you were thinking there on the on the final deadlifts yeah so just i was gonna kind of run out like i pushed i was stubborn got myself into a bad position and this is where i had been told for the attempt i was talking with rodney as far as like what we want for a third, that the, the other two guys probably like, probably out of reach and secure gold after the second. Right? And I knew I was going to have to load up three nine, which would be a uh, for him. And even though I spend so much time staying to knowing I have to make every single attempt, mm -hmm. that moment where it came off the ground. And I was in a position. There's that choice of do I fight this? Slightly bad position and probably finish it. Because looking back, my post this will be a full and train as uh, 350, 770. And it was like relatively smooth. Um, and it, it was one of those things maybe I could have fought, fought for lift. Maybe I couldn't have. But decision in my head was oh there's not a time on this. let's not injure myself or potentially injure something for nationals and that's just why I let it go so quickly because as soon as I recognize oh I'm not in a good spot like got it and called it now that could come back to bite me I huge and 12 flows because I gave up a lift thinking I had won. That's a failure on my part, <laughs> you know? I'm all stemming from lack of patience in getting set for the lift. But, you know, I just wanted to share that thought. Process. That's kind of what I bunch people come up to me like, oh, it, didn't, it seemed to move off the ground fast. Why did you, you stop on it? That was exactly why I was like, ah, it's wrapped Let's not injure anything. Let's live the lift another day. And then um, in nationals, I'll get revenge on that, I'm sure. For sure. Yeah, thanks for taking us through that. You were cutting up. Uh, your audio is kind of cutting out quite a bit there, but I think everyone could kind of under, could understand what you were saying. I, I know I was at least able to understand that basically um, instead of continuing to yank on that third deadlift and injured, possibly in, risking injury, even though it was moving smooth, you set it back down. You did the wise and mature thing, especially at that point in the game, you were pretty much already known in your head that you've got the W wrapped up here that you're going to win this. So really no point in um, risking injury. Steve Crane in the chat is asking a good question. When you have that win well in hand, and I mean, of course, you don't, um, you know, you, you, you're always a little bit leery with these big deadlifters, right? But you pretty much knew you had the win in hand. You knew Mike T was going to have to pull beyond a world record in order to win. And it was probably unlikely. He's asking, is there a slight letdown in focus or intensity on the last pull? You have to bring it back to personal reasons. And I think this is fairly often with Mel. A lot of times, you know, my talking about winner man you like to eat by so it. Um, but when the competition is out of it, then you have to rely on other motivations. And for me that's enjoying the moment. Like realize, like, hey, I'm here in an island in the middle of the how many people to see that. And then Lastly, just like my own personal you know, PRs and things like that, which 
to me, are just as valuable as the the championships and the winning, and that plays a balance for the vision. All right, I think I got that. Mike Gold, did you get that? Yeah. The one, one thing I was going to ask is, right, so um, you kind of had a locked up coming to the last pull. So that last pull, um, how did you decide – the number meaning was it just a matter of like hitting a, a certain PR or whatever? Cause like I, I was actually looking and I noticed that that last pull would have put you at 925.5, which would have uh, came second at worlds. I, I'm wondering if that number, if like the number had any like significance <laughs> or if it was just like, that's what I thought it's in the tank or, or what, what was like the reasoning behind that number? Yeah. Two things. You nailed the first one. Uh, it would have been the second place total at world so it uh personal uh i wouldn't have won anything for that, but i wanted to get to say that and two it was uh, the next increment of a pr left you know i hit 350 nationals in february so 352 and a half was the step up Man, that is amazing. So you're going for PRs on all three lifts. PR, obviously, PR total. Um, you know, international platform going against three monsters with all the pressure in the world on your back. Um, just absolutely, uh, j- you had a fantastic day. I mean, you balled out, and I mean, like you said, that you might have been able to hit that 352 if it wasn't for the extenuating circumstance. And you could have been, yeah, bragging about, hey, I would have finished second out world. So maybe next year, team U.S. national team needs to bring me out there so I can show off on the biggest platform in the world. Um, that's really big. Um, we got another. Uh, oh, Stephen Crane was just saying uh, in the chat that the energy in the room was incredible that night. And as we're watching these videos of yours in squad and then uh, some of these, you're the person coming up after you was Ray Williams, right? Like, so I remember this because, you know, I would be filming you and then I would come into the warm-up room and there's Susie and Ray right there. And they're about to come out and do their thing. So talk a little bit just about the atmosphere um, and what it was like kind of, because now two comps in a row, you've been on the same platform with a couple of bosses in your own weight class within the one twenties and legendary Mike T. And then in addition to that, you also in, in nationals were in the same flight as, as Ray Williams again. So two times, how does it feel being out there and how's the crowd um, whenever Ray Williams is in the room? Oh man. Yeah. It was fantastic. It seems to, um, you competition. Uh, I've been to North America. One second, man. You're, you're uh, cutting out. 119 agree. And give us one yeah. second here. Uh, Tristan, try turning off your video. So we we'll just have audio from you. Um, and maybe that'll help clean, right. up, clean up the uh, audio. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Can you hear? Go ahead and, and, and say that again. Yeah, you, that I think you, said, you said it was fantastic right. atmosphere. Go ahead and elaborate. You know, I've been to North American championships in the past. International meets in general tend to be sometimes quiet. Uh, And I think part of that is, you know, you get groups of nations who are rooting for their own lifter, rightfully so. And it can be just kind of uh, just a quiet experience. But this time it was not quiet at all. It was a heck of a crowd. and. I really appreciated all of the energy, especially because I tend to feed off of that energy. I really enjoy it. So kind of going to your point, I think lived alongside the likes of Tushir, Ray Williams, uh, Bryce Krupchak, all of those guys who have established themselves in the sport and being so dominant. It's a real experience and there's there's moments where you catch yourself thinking like you know i'm really here do a belong in a situation uh, it's it's cool i got myself to the point like okay I belong here but it it's never it's never any less on that's for sure Great. And the last question, and then we'll let you go because we do have, we've got Alex Sador in the room um, who's going to come in and, and join us and start talking about uh, junior nationals or junior worlds. Um, so we'll have to let you go, Tristan, in just a second. But the last question I wanted to ask was just yeah, a, about your motivation on the day, like how you were hyping yourself up because man, I can't wait to pull the footage 
and show people because Lane posted his and everyone thinks Lane is crazy. Like he screams and, and yells and comes running out and all this kind of stuff. And, and Lane was messaging me in the DMS and he's like, man, I'm a total psychopath. When I watch back these videos, I look like a total psych psychopath. And I replied to him. I'm like, you look mild compared to Tristan though, man. Like Tristan really goes crazy. So just tell us how you tap into that and what, what you're thinking about um, whenever you're going into that frenzy, like you do. Yeah, um, it, I would like to call it control chaos, you know? So, like, I, you have to stay in this area where I, I'm still focused enough to execute on lifts and not make dumb mistakes on, on the day. But it's also, so like, caffeine, go into a little bit of small science here, but like caffeine essentially um, brings adrenaline into your system. And that's why caffeine is so effective, right? It gives you energy from the adrenaline. My thought process is if I can do that to myself and bring more adrenaline into my system without having to take even more caffeine or anything like that, then theoretically that should um, elicit a, a good strength response. So slowly over the years, I've myself to be more outward and getting myself up. Now, uh, Natalie, my girlfriend, kind of brought it up me the other day because she always laughs. She's, she's like, I can hear you in the back talking to yourself. Like, what are you doing back there? Um, and part of it and she brought it up she's like do you think this distracts your opponents and i was like well i guess i never really thought about it i i know mike as an example mike and i are complete opposite so sit in the corner and kind of be in his zone until he comes out and he'll lift whereas i'm pacing around i don't think i sit down the entire meet um but Part of it is a protective response. So years back at, in Bruce at my first Worlds, I was very much like kind of internal, like Mike. And there was another lifter there who was very outward. He was like dancing, you know. And I found that distracting to me. And I, I was like, what's this guy doing? And it it kind of brought me out of my zone a little bit. So... In order to prevent myself from doing that, I just flip it, and now I'm the one who's always doing something crazy. And that way, if someone else is pacing around or dancing, I'm so focused on what I'm doing that I can't get distracted anymore. It's like a defense mechanism um, to do that. And really, to uh, display what I'm thinking about, any little thing, like a little light that I may have encountered over the years. This sounds cliche and silly, but you know, like, ask your mom once, and she said, no. Ah, that makes me a little irritated. <laughs> you know, or if anyone told me that they don't think I can do something, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a little motivation that I bring in for the day of, of the meet, and it all just kind of conglomerates on me, and all that. Well, I got to say, I think you're just one of my favorite lifters. Like I, I, I've, there was a time you, okay. So I'll just give a little color to this because you're, uh, and we'll show the videos. We're definitely, I'm definitely going to work on your video like tonight, tomorrow morning and uh, post it because you're so different and you're, you're saying awesome. to yourself, you're like breathing really heavy and you're like, winners don't miss winners don't miss. And you're like, and you're saying all kinds of stuff like this to yourself. And then someone will come and like tap you on the shoulder and be like, Oh, excuse me. Like, are these your uh, gummy bears or whatever? And you'll, you'll pull your head and be like, Oh yeah, go ahead. You're like so polite and gentle. I remember you were standing in the back of the hallway and someone came up to you and maybe they asked you for a selfie or I forget what it was exactly, but you were like pacing around, like grunting and growling and like saying these things to yourself. And then 
I think, and then maybe it was Rodney like tapped you on the shoulder and you're like, Oh yeah, what's, what's up? What do you need? Uh, you know, like so polite and nice. Like, and that's just like, like you are, like you are now on the podcast and as a teacher, as a, as a high school teacher and everything, like you're such a big teddy bear that everyone loves. You're so soft-spoken and like a gentle giant, you know? Um, but then it's like on game day when it's time to lift, you become a crazy man. Um, so I would love to hear more. Uh, you should talk about this on your own YouTube channel a little bit, because I'm sure you get a lot of questions about this. And, and since you're cutting out a lot and we got to have Alex come in, we're going to have to, um, you know, pop switch, yeah. switch, switch gears here and bring in Alex. But I would love it if you made a YouTube video where you talk about it and where, what your girlfriend thinks about it and stuff like this. And like other people that have just <laughs> heard it, um, and it was funny. So you were mentioning uh, about uh, someone asked a question. Was it, I don't know if it was Julia or Mike. That was like, is it distracting for other people? Um, Mike Garazzo is in the chat and he's the one that uh, has to go, has gone against lane now two times. And, um, and you know, lane <laughs> is very similar in his amount of hype. And he says it's definitely distracting. Um, so for sure. So, uh, and and uh, lifted on a prayer. I believe that's Amy Hutchison is saying, don't forget about me. LOL. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> explain yourself yep. there, Amy. What do you mean by that? Amy, it's, uh, it's, um, Oh, it's oh, this is Michelle. This is Michelle uh, Carlosio. Yes. Uh, so Michelle gets the fan of the NAPF award by far. She came to the most sessions. She screamed the loudest. Um, she did everything. Um, but yeah, Michael Garazzo is in the, is in the chat here and he's saying it's definitely distracting. And I definitely remember him. Yeah. Michelle, Michelle Carlosio is in here and Oh, and, and Amy Hutchison is yeah. in here. So we got a lot of people in the chat popping in here. But anyway, uh, go ahead, Tristan. Any final thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, on like the getting distracted. Or just before we let you go. Part? Or just before we let you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, I there's a, to wrap up that part as far as the meat day energy there's that's part of executing on meet day and i'll certainly you know uh, i'll apologize if if i distract anyone no nah, don't apologize part man. of the condition you know if if those things come up and i'm sure right yeah so it, if uh, i think my understands my team and it's kind of part of it, but they're both professionals at what they do. And I fully would accept that they can in spite of whatever else is going around them. So, um, you know, we all do it a little bit, and that's what makes it fun. As far as I'll uh, try and throw together some YouTube videos on that content, keep an eye out. I'm looking to do uh, a long recap video as well on the trip. So if anyone wants to check out the channel, it's uh, Rod's Strength Training. So shameless plug, wherever that is. <laughs> um, For sure. And I appreciate you all having me on. It's always a blast. Yeah, man, it's, it's great. You're one of the great ambassadors for the sport. It's always a pleasure seeing you lift, um, being able to be up close and personal with you and talk to you in between disciplines and things like that is a real honor for me. Uh, I don't take it lightly and uh, definitely going to get you a ton of footage for that. So um, thank you, man. We're going to go ahead and sign you off here because um, like, as I mentioned, we, you know, you're cutting out, but we were able to get un and understand everything that you said, but definitely everyone go follow him on Instagram, post the links in your story to your, your YouTube videos that you're putting out. You put he's putting out a ton of content. His YouTube is blowing up. So um, go subscribe to his YouTube for sure. And with that, um, Tristan, it was great talking to you again, as always. We'll catch you next time. Sounds good. Thank you all. Next time. Good okay, night. Man. Okay, Tristan, um, that was awesome. Um, just, just to, over, and also I, I've, I've, I've allowed Alex to enter the room or whatever it's called on here, if he's in here.
there he is. All right. He's hey. in here. So, so let's keep talking about NAPF for a minute because, you know, it's such a big deal. We don't want to wrap it up, but I don't want to keep you just waiting in the waiting room there, Alex, because you can join in on these kind of conversations and stuff as well. Um, you definitely been, been in there and in the trenches, just like, uh, like we all have. And you probably got to see, did you see Tristan Nasalrod lift, uh, in Austin? Uh, yeah, I did actually. I, and I saw that he, I remember the situation that happened with him with the drug testing. Uh, he got like pulled out of drug testing. He got like pulled out um, mid meet with that whole thing. Yeah, to do to do drug testing in the middle. Yeah, but so you can kind of see like his persona in the warm up room, like especially right when he's about to come out to lift, like he gets so fired up. Um, but Mike Garazzo is in the chat, and he he was, he won the ninety three M ones, a, a heated battle with him and Lane. Um, it was absolutely epic. Uh, Gabriel Garcia was already also in there threatening from Mexico. And, um, he was saying it's definitely distracting whenever your opponent is kind of like in Lane's own words, going psychotic, um, uh, before he, before they come out to lift and, um, Michael, um, we'll have you on a podcast. I, I mentioned before, after I get back from Romania, we're going to do an interview, long extended interview with you. But, um, he, I remember very clearly there was a ton of hype for all these sessions. The crowd was absolutely electric, like uh, JW wrench. I don't know who that is, but you're in the chat saying people were standing on the chairs and waving flags and filming and stuff like this. And, and so the crowd was definitely electric. And I remember Susie Gary, who was handling Michael, um, just stopping him uh, after Lane had like kind of left the little area, uh, the little staging area and just being like, don't let all the hype and excitement get to you. Like, just stay calm stay cool, you know, breathe. She was telling him breathe stuff like this. And, um, obviously he handled his business, went out and hit that last pull. And it was just, you know, absolutely awesome. Like the crowd went nuts and everything like that, but yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be different. Um, he's saying in the chat, she also shoved me so I couldn't look at his lift. Oh, so Michael was out there probably trying to get a sneak peek because the way the staging area was set up was basically, if you were standing in the staging area, you're up next, you would have, you would be facing straight to the platform and you would have a look. So, yeah. uh, Susie doing a good job there of trying to keep Michael out of his head and everything like that. Remember those stories, Mike, we're going to get you on. Um, but Alex, did you watch any of the North American championships or did you kind of follow the coverage of it? Oh yeah, absolutely. I followed basically all of it. I mean, from the juniors to the, I mean, masters to open, I followed all of it. So what were some of the highlights for you that you saw? Um, definitely the three-way battle, obviously with Tristan, Mike, and um, Bryce, because actually I saw Bryce around two or three weeks ago in Canada when it was me, Carolyn, Delaney, and Gavin training at Bryce's gym. And he let us there tr train there. And it was awesome uh, meeting him in person. Uh, I've been looking up to him for a while seeing his youtube videos i mean he's been in the game for a decade now and he's posted a lot of informative content on youtube uh it was cool meeting him has a nice gym in there and yeah i was watching that um watching Susie uh because she you know she's been a big part of my powerlifting recently um for coaching at juniors and just you know being my being a motivation for me uh, so i was watching her I was watching some juniors. I was watching like the 66 to 83 juniors. Um, and, and then they end an open, you know, 83 to like 120 plus watching Ray get back on uh, on the platform since February. I mean, yeah, it was, it was watched basically try to watch as much as possible, watch as much as possible. That's great, man. You're a student of the game. I know, I know you're a big nerd for the sport. Uh, yeah. So that's why we want to have you on here to talk about uh, Junior Worlds upcoming. Um, I do want to just run through a couple more things about NAPF uh, before we move on. And Julia, this is where I'm going to read through some of the best lifters from the Team USA. And then if you want to give your summary too from uh, some of the best performances that you saw, and then we'll get into Junior Worlds and uh, and Sub Junior Worlds. But um, on the US team, they won. We won seven best lifter awards. And so I just want to mention those real quick. Keegan Bucci won the men's classic sub junior best lifter. Philip Trong, the Trongster won men's classic junior best lifter. Uh, Gail Williams, the legend, uh, won women's classic M fours best lifter. John Laflamme, we knew he was going to handle business and, and win the men's classic M fours. Um, and then on the equip side, women's equip sub junior, Isabel Olivares was a best lifter men's equip sub junior. Bo Paralu was a best lifter men's equip junior. Kyle Ullman was the best lifter. 
And then uh, that's it for us as far as Team USA. I do want to shout out Sammy DePass and Kafui Hatsunyami. They won the women and the men's classic open divisions, uh, the best lifters. And on the equip side, there was an absolute legend from Canada, Simone Lai, won the equipped open. And Carlos Campos Murillo, um, affectionately known as Manuel, Manolo um, from Costa Rica, um, he won on the men's equipped side as well, uh, men's equipped open. So just shout out some of the best lifters there. Obviously, uh, if you're winning best lifter awards, you had some of the best performances of the whole competition. As I mentioned before, uh, the Trongster had a huge performance with the 100 good lifts, uh, 100 good lift points, 100.7 good lift points um, in the classic juniors. He had himself a hell of a day. And, um, it was a great performance. Um, anyone, anyone else that you guys want to mention, um, go ahead, uh, Julia with your, with your recap. Yeah. So, um, right off the bat, you know, I, I wanted to say, uh, obviously very impressed, uh, with the junior lifters, um, especially, uh, Phil Trung and, um, Keegan Bucci, I believe is his yeah. name. Yeah. He won, he swept the golds and he wasn't unopposed or anything. He just, he just swept the golds. Yeah. Uh, which is a big, huge accomplishment. But, uh, you know, we were anticipating the battle in the 120s and we were anticipating the battle in the 76s. And to a certain extent, we were anticipating this battle between Lane and Michael in the 93s. Um, but really, I think, you know, like people are like, oh, well, uh, people don't pay attention to masters. Well, they're paying attention now because I I think to me that was probably the most compelling battle, um, the way it played out of of the um, entire meet. Um, you know, they both went nine for nine. It really came down to who was stronger on the day, and that's um, everything you want to see. Um, so I I thought that was great. It's great for. Um, masters lifting um it's great for napf i mean you know king of the lifts is talking about this um now and uh so i i thought that was that was really awesome and then uh luella bowden i mean she squatted 584 high bar high bar um yeah. i i just um you know people say you know, there's these records that'll never be broken. You know, these so and so is the greatest of all time. I we can never see anyone topping that. And people come along like these records are going to fall. You know, we're just we're just seeing the beginning of this. I mean, that was incredible, and it, it didn't really look as difficult as I thought it would. Um, so, I think you know that's also a great segue into. Um, into junior worlds because uh, we have not one, but two really strong sub junior females in the 84 plus class, which is something that, um, you know, I personally love to see. I, you know, when the, when the battles are in those heavyweight classes, I think those are, are the funnest battles to watch. For sure. Um, I definitely, we don't wanna um, move on to juniors, uh, junior worlds just yet, but because I do wanna mention like Dalton Laco he balled out, um, in the, in the 59s, like he had a big total. He put on a, he put on a show for the people. The crowd was going nuts for his deadlifts. He was in the same session with Jonathan Garcia, who squatted a world record, open world record, you know, um, which was, his, I think it was his in the past. And he got the crowd super fired up. He's like, do you want to see it? You know? And like, and then he came out and did it. And afterwards he was like, yes. You know, he was like screaming and stuff. It was so, so hyped up. And, um, you know, so I want to get Mike, Gold's take on what you thought about Jonathan Garcia's performance. Well, I mean, obviously his performance was phenomenal. He squatted the world record. Uh, I think he should have pulled for the total world record. I think it was there. Um, in general, the only thing, uh, deadlift is his worst lift. And a big part of that is grip. Like when he gets heavy, he very often like misses on grip. But um, the way his deadlifts moved, it looked like, I think it was, would have been eight kilos needed a more uh, for the world record. It looked like it was there. And I don't know if there's a specific purpose in 703. Um, I mean, it's a total PR. It's breaking the 700s. Nice. But I think that breaking the world record would have given him consideration for a Sheffield spot. Um, it would have broken the world record. It would have obviously totaled more than the winner at Worlds did. 
And um, there was zero, on, on the men's side, there were no male lifters at Worlds that broke the world record and didn't win. So like on the, on the female side, there were, but on the male side, um, this, the highest second place finisher was at like 98% of the world record. So I think breaking the world record would at least given him some consideration. So I personally would have done that, but um, I mean, it was phenomenal. He, he missed his third bench. If he hit his yeah. third bench. He went that, up eight. He went up eight kilos and went from right. 170 to 178, which must've been a North American record or something. Um, yeah. So that would have, that would have been, that would have given him the world record total with his deadlift. So I assume the plan was to squat what he did squat, to bench what his third bench was and to pull what he did. Like, I assume those were all the numbers planned to break the world record. And then I guess when he missed the third bench, I guess they decided not to push the deadlift. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was very strong performance. It's just going to be, it's going to be crazy because even so he's going to have to come back next year and fight in a monster 66 battle again. So who are you expecting to be in that battle besides Brian Lee? Is there anyone else uh, so that should be on our radar? Other people who, I don't know, in the past we've been told not to say names of people who haven't switched over yet, but there there's likely going to be at least one more person who ends okay. up. Um, plus also there's still Rodrigo. I know he didn't like, he didn't do as well this past year, but like he's still, he's always he's still there. A very lifter and he's still yeah. a threat. He's he's training. He posts his training like every day, man. He's training his ass off always. Like he. Well, actually, you know what I should mention? I, I should bridge the gap between this and what we're about to talk about. But um, coming up from the juniors next year, Kyle will be will be trying to make the open team. And Kyle Nowak, we we're talking yeah, about here. And yeah. And if he totals what I think he's capable, I think he's capable of totaling at junior worlds this year. He'll be really damn close, like already. Okay, and where does this 703 uh, would have finished at Worlds? Would that have been second place? Wouldn't Back have, in the end. It would, it, would been, it would have been two kilos off. Yeah, so damn, if he just had two and a half kilos on bench instead of missing that that jump for eight kilos, he could have had the best total as a 66 this year. I mean, on an international competition, uh, made a good case for Sheffield. Um, all right, any other thoughts, you, um, Alex or Julia, about – Jonathan Garcia and his performance. I definitely wanted to shout him out. Yeah. I mean, he had a, he had an absolutely great, great performance and it's good that he's fixed the things that he had at the last meet where like depth was probably an issue and stuff like that. It's good that he fixed it at NAPFs and especially to even a higher standard at an international competition. And I'm really happy where NAPFs is going because it's really following, um, you know, like the other federation, other regions like euros like the oceana um i'm really liking where napfs is going um super more competitive and just building more traction about it and i think it's like the lifters that that don't make worlds still should do napfs because it could be like your statement of what i would have done at worlds or you mm -hmm. know something similar to that so i really like how like where we're going with napfs and um you know what property america is doing that doing for that and yeah he had a great performance um lane had a great performance and then mike had a great like you know pulling for the win is great it was awesome to see that watching that um i think it, it did glitch out on the phone i was watching it and then the last pull cut out which was annoying um okay. on the live stream on the on the uh, the live stream but um i yeah then i saw mike one i was like wow this it was it was a really good battle um and that's what you know that's what it's all about it's all about the good battles it's all about going nine for nine it's all about just the hype that builds around it and just like the characters that are in powerlifting um you know that lift at the highest standard you yeah. had a great go ahead julia yeah i mean just to go off of that a little bit um i think you know uh, maybe we haven't all um listened to the the podcast that uh, just dropped on king of lifts with brandon petrie but um he said you know we want to bring legitimacy to NAPF and he suggested a few things that would do it. And I think people getting close to being considered for the Sheffield um, or for, sorry, for Sheffield um, based on their totals that they total at NAPF is going to be a big deal. And, you know, he got close, he got close. I don't, again, you know, I think Mike is right that I don't, I don't think that this is going to really put him in the running for it, but um, it, it's starting to be a meet that people actually look at it and they have to watch not just because it's entertaining um to see you know the lifters that are there but because there's competitive lifters that people have to watch out for on the yeah. world stage 
we talked so, about last year how um, some lifters like Carlina and Leah qualified out of not out of worlds, right? They qualified out of other meets. And yeah. here we had a situation where um, definitely Jonathan Garcia, maybe if he totals three, four kilos more, maybe seven kilos more would be hard to argue that he wouldn't at least get a look at going, going to Sheffield from this. If there were more wild card spots available, I know there's only one wild card spot open at this time. Also Tristan, same thing, had a little chip on his shoulder two years in a row, not getting to go to the world championships, but gets to now come here and ball out. And I put out a signature performance here, you know, um, also we just saw world records across the board. So, um, whenever, like I mentioned before, Amy Hutchison had posted, earlier today that there was 15 world records. Um, we mentioned a few of them here, but I know that I believe Melissa Copeland, did she hit a bench world record? Um, she, she hit a world record. I know Lillian Jackson, no, maybe it was Lily hit a, hit a bench world record and Melissa might've hit a, a squat world record. Is that right? Um, and then I know Carlos Lewis in the masters also hit a squat world record. I know John Laflamme hit a squat world record. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there's world records falling all over the place. It's, you don't really get an opportunity to do that. So, um, <clears throat> one of, one of the junior lifters was mentioning to me after the fact, um, that it's, it was really cool that they got to pull for a world record. Um, and two of them, in fact, pulled, tried to pull for world records. Um, I'm going to look up the, the names here. Um, it was Nabil, Rafai and Keegan Bucci. They both pulled for world records and Ke and, and Nabil was, I talked with him for a while afterwards and he was just saying, you know, it's such an honor to be able to go out and try to do something that no one in the world has ever done before. And whether it's at NAPF or it's at the world championships, or it's at one of these other international meets where you can break and set world records. Um, that's a really cool thing to like, very few people can say that they tried to break an official world record, you know, um, on a platform with IPF refs, international refs and stuff like that. So it's a very cool thing. It was a very cool competition. One last point I wanted to hit on was just that, um, <clears throat> we are talking about when Tristan was kind of mentioning that in previous international competition, because Tristan, if you go back and look at his open power thing, he's been to a ton of international competitions, like I think like six or seven. And he said, oftentimes it's super quiet and the teams are just, and the people in the crowd are just cheering on their team. And we kind of saw that a little bit in Malta, right? Mike, where like when team France would come out, they had a big contingency in the crowd and some of the other squads, New Zealand had like a pretty big contingency in the crowd when they would walk out and the U S we don't, we are, we don't really have fans that really travel. It's just sort of like the lifters that are there or the friends and family of the people that are traveling with the lifters that are in the crowd. And it's usually a pretty small contingency because it's far usually for us to travel to some of these international competitions I mean, and it's expensive. New Zealand and Australia are further and they both had, they both they had will yeah, but it, and so maybe it's also not just it, maybe they didn't really have fans, but just that their lifters stick around too. like, you know, some of our lifters just bounce, they lift and then they bounce. And whereas yeah. in other countries like Leah was there screaming for everyone, like Pana was there screaming the days before for the 47s and 52s, um, yeah. where we, we don't get that quite as much. But at the NAPF, everyone is screaming for everyone. Like it, it's, it's truly a friendship cup. It's truly a, a lot of camaraderie where everyone wanted to see Ray ball. Everyone wanted to, was screaming for Tristan. The, I think probably the loudest the crowd might've ever got the entire time was during Luella's third squat. Like people were absolutely going nuts for her. Um, and that was a huge, that was a huge squat for sure. Um, so that's one thing that separates NAPF. It's a way more of a family like we feel like we're the the north american family and we all want everyone to succeed and we and of course we want to win but we're all cheering for each other in all the other weight classes and things like that and a lot of the other countries again i mean besides michelle carlosio and um dr michael harris they were there for quite also john laflamme and carlos lewis um first of all they're boys which is crazy like they room together they couldn't be more different like they're they're just like so much different from each other carlos is like every other word is an f-bomb and and then john laflamme is like the nicest sweetheart from maine that's like so polite and soft-spoken but they were hanging out together the whole time like going to dinner and stuff and, and they also those those four people they came to damn near every session lily jackson i saw her in the crowd a lot melissa copeland was in the crowd a lot um and just cheering on everyone so it's a little bit different too because it's a vacation destination so people tend to stay the whole time as opposed to just lift and bounce as well so really cool um last thing i want to talk about and this will be our transition if anyone else wants to add anything on to these topics but i don't want to have mike gold talk about luella a little bit but before you get into that julia or alex you guys have anything you want to add to that 
Um, yeah, just uh, Carlos Lewis is uh, so fun. Uh, I talked to him for a while. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's cool because you get to know um, these people really well. Uh, I feel like I've made some really good friends um, that in a way that really doesn't happen at nationals, even at, even at you know, like big mega nats from like a few years ago, it's just, it's not the same because, you know, and maybe it's because it was in like a, a small island, you know, um, whatever, whatever the case may be. But um, yeah, it's really cool to see all these great lifters and like get to know them and really see their personalities. That was, that was a really cool experience. For sure. It's definitely different. Um, some of the Central American countries like Belize, Trinidad and Tobago. So Trinidad and Tobago, that's big news. They were back for the first time in the IPF. They're now back in the good graces of the IPF. Maybe that's a path for Rondell Hunt. Um, they have this, this lifter named Joseph that put on a, an absolute show. If you watch the live stream, he like looks up at the bench camera. <laughs> yeah. There's a thumbs up. As I he saw sits that. Down. I, did, I did see that. Yeah, yeah. He's a showman baby. And he came in, he came yeah. in, uh, we talked to them. He, he's man, the future is bright for Trinidad and Tobago. They had some, yeah. some other uh, good lifters in there. They had a, a, their coach was handling business. Um, but Belize goes crazy, um, as well. So, and yeah, it came in islands, obviously for any time their lifters were in the room, they would go crazy too. So, um, yeah. Any other thoughts, Alex, you got anything? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't there in person. I wish I was because, uh, it seemed like a really good, um, atmosphere and, you know, powerlifting destination. And then obviously the vacationing after, but, um, no, it was, it looked really awesome, uh, from just like the live stream perspective and the fans there and like a lot of good energy in the room. And that's just like what powerlifting needs. And especially after like COVID, um, you know, people were probably unmotivated to come back to work, come back to, you know, lifting. Some people just didn't, couldn't lift for a full year, full, full nine months, whatever it was um you know we just want to bring energy back into powerlifting and we want to bring storylines storylines back in uh we, we want to just blow the sport up um you know we are still a very small sport and we just want to make the sport as big as possible and it's what it's going to take it's going to take showmen it's going to take promoting the sport it's going to take doing things that we've never done before in the sport um and that's also just supporting um getting the fans involved more getting you know everyone that comes to the meets like it's i, I think it's a great thing to you know you compete and then stay after for like the next two to three days to watch the other competitors compete and, you know, cheer them on because, you know, you always want to be there for them and for your team, especially for, you know, United States, Belize, Cayman Islands, like cheer your fellow teammates on. Um, but yeah, it seemed like a great time there at the NAPFs. For sure. Man, yeah, we're getting a lot of people in the chat have been mentioning this and Jordan just mentioned it, you know, these regional uh, championships, the atmosphere just simply unmatched. He's been, he's been at a lot of the equipped nationals and can speak on the equipped side or equipped worlds and can speak on the equipped side of things. All right, Mike gold, take us home, baby. Let's talk about Luella. Tell us about what she happened, what she did and her amazing performance. And we'll transition over to junior worlds, which I think we're like, just like a week and a few days out from the start of junior, the junior world championship, junior and sub junior world championship. So go ahead, Mike. Yes. Yeah, so before we get to Junior Worlds, I guess we'll discuss something that bridges NAPF and Junior Worlds. So Luella um, competed and she's competing again in two weeks. So quick turnaround. But she um, squatted 265, which she broke uh, Leanne Hewitt's 262.5 sub junior squat world record. Um, uh, she benched, uh, I believe, 117 and she deadlifted. Um, 200, missed in our second, retook on our third. So she put up a huge performance. Um, not the not the sub junior. Uh, was it the sub junior total world record? I'm not sure what that what that is. Um, I'll take a look while you're talking here. I think, I think not, it might be. Uh, it's the Mahalia. Yeah, Mahalia. I don't yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think yeah, I think yeah. it's her. So I don't think I don't think she took that world record, but um, she took the squat and. She, she had a huge total, so um, definitely impressive. I'm definitely curious to see how that affects her performance in two weeks because in general, uh, going RP10 and then competing in two weeks later is difficult, especially when you're like a bigger lifter and it's uh, more absolute weight. So um, I guess it'll be interesting to see how she could perform then, but I think it's even better than I initially probably expected. Like she had a massive squat PR. Like I think she hit, what was it? It was like 230 uh, in, in Austin. Something like that. I don't yeah, know exactly. I don't have it pulled up. 
it was something like that. Something like a 35 kilo squat PR in, in uh, five months, which is insane. That's like beginner, like new begins numbers, like hitting a 35 kilo squat PR in, in five months is absolute insanity. So, so she broke the squat world record by two and a half kilos. You're right. That was 262.5. Yeah. So you hit up, a, put up a 265. Um, interesting. She didn't take a chip. I guess it's not really necessary because she wasn't really going against anyone, but, um, you know, it's always smart to take a chip. And then the total, I'm just pulling this up, is Leanne Actually, Hewitt. Actually, she's, be she's better off not taking a chip. 6.15. Oh, why? So she can use it in, in yeah, uh, Romania. Yeah, she didn't use the chip. Now yeah. she'll have a, a lighter chip. So 6.15.5 is the total from Leanne Hewitt in the 84-plus sub-juniors. Okay, so she's still, she's still like 30, whatever, 32 kilos behind that. Yeah, So, but still amazing performance. And like I said, and on the squat, you could see that she, on, on the walkout, she had a little wobble, like she almost like rolled an ankle or something. Like she, she had a little misstep. Uh, and then, and like I said, the crowd was like going absolutely crazy. So it was, it's, I think it was good. Like she had the right amount of adversity where I don't think it was anything that's going to mentally mess her up going into Romania. There wasn't anything like, like, like she failed a lifts lifts on strength that she thought that she could hit or anything like this, where it's going to get in her head. She faced that adversity on the walkout of her world record squat. Um, she faced adversity on her second deadlift and then came back and got it. And she was able to lock out. I, I think the biggest question with her is a lockout on deadlift for sure. And she was, no, I, think the, I think the biggest question I give her a lot of credit is her squats looked high in training and she got all three squats. So yeah, she gets a lot of credit. She did her first international competition and she was able to adjust and uh, hit what she like hit what the, the refs all said were good. So um, that's definitely good. She's already has a big squat now that she has the confidence on the platform. Like I, I think she's going to be one of she's going to be joining the 600 pound squat club, like probably not in Romania. I don't see it. Um, I think she really went like all out in terms of squat, but I assume next year, definitely. So we'll have another one. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's transition then into uh, the world championship. So she had a, go ahead, Julia, go ahead. Yeah. So um, I actually talked to her coach for a little bit um, after the fact, and he said that they, they wanted, they opened pretty conservatively on deadlift and um, he thinks she has more in the tank. Um, I guess they just didn't have baby powder um, back there or, or she didn't know to grab it or something. Um, and so that was part of what happened. So that was like, um, purely a mishap. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look out for that. Um, there's, there's definitely a little bit more in the tank there. They, they intentionally opened extremely light and, um, yeah, that minor mistake, they didn't even want to take, uh, two, 200, I believe. Um, they didn't even want to take that originally, but, you know, decided to just because, you know, how could you not in that atmosphere? But um, I think that will be amended as well. So we should be able to see a little bit more on her deadlift uh, as well. For sure. I mean, that's another thing. The uh, In terms of the warm-up room, the facilities um, at the NAPF this year in the Cayman Islands, it's definitely not up to par with what you're going to see at the World Championships. Like, Mike, it, was, it's, it wasn't like a bunch of Alecos and like six Aleco racks and everything like it was in Malta for sure. It was like different kinds of racks, you know, different bench pads. There was one Aleco back there, different kind of bars and stuff like this. The bars, the bars weren't even Aleco. No. Did they at least have like 20, like the 20 kg Ohio bars or were you like, no, up? they were weird looking bars, bro. They had a weird tip on <laughs> oh, the end of them. I don't even know what they were. That's terrible. You're warming up on like some commercial gym bar. That's one of them <laughs> didn't have the right knurling either, either like the markings. I remember Susie telling someone, All right when she's pulling um like basically like like the, the someone was pulling a, a last warm up on deadlift and she's like make sure that you know you put your hands where you normally put them because these markings are a little off that, it sounds like the the ghetto the ghetto bar in the uh warm up room in turkey come on don't be calling the cayman islands ghetto over here man no no, this, no I'm just in, in, in turkey they had like this one oh, rack yeah, yeah. bar that anyone could use and it yeah, was yeah. like i don't even know what here's the thing yeah. Um, this is the first time I hear that they didn't have, she didn't have baby powder. That's really on your coach to bring baby powder, like chalk and yeah. baby powder. You got to bring your own. Like, like I, I, there were some complaints that there wasn't enough chalk sometimes 
And I'm like, bro, uh, you saw Team Canada. They had their own Tupperware with chalk that they were bringing out for their team and everything like that. Like you gotta, you gotta come prepared with baby powder and chalk. And so that's on us. Uh, if anything, that's not, uh, or on her coach, that's not on Luella. And that's not on the Cayman Islands uh, squad that hosted this meet either. Um, overall though, I heard no complaints. Like, like, you know, in the U S you'll hear complaints about like the smallest of things in the warm up room. You know, if you don't have this or you don't have that here, nobody complained for a single thing. I never, I was in the warm up room a ton, not a single complaint. And I'm telling you, I was looking at those bench. Some of those bench pads were like ERX. And I was just like, whoa, those bench pads do not look great, but no one was complaining and people were hitting bench world records and stuff. So, you know, it's a, it's a sign that, you know, you have to overcome adversity. Like what you're saying last year in, in Turkey, stuff was maybe not up to par. That's what's going to be. Sometimes it's not going to be like open worlds where you're going to have like all Aleko, everything in the warm up room. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't even remember what racks it was last year in Turkey. I don't I think there was like a mix of variety. Like I don't even know if there was Lico. Maybe there was like a few, but like, yeah, that's the, that's the biggest thing in powerlifting. And I've come to realize that because I think a few years ago I was like super specific on what I train on and I am now, but just like so nitpicky and just like, you can't, you can't be like that. You know, you obviously want the best equipment possible, but you just never know what you're going to, you never know what's going to happen when you get there. You never know how everything's going to go. Um, it's actually funny because we, me and Carolyn, we were just in Florida and we actually saw a fellow um, competitor. We went to a random gym in Florida and we saw a fellow um, sub junior competitor, the 74 who's going to Romania. And he was asking us questions um, because, you know, as we went, we went to Turkey last year. Nick there's Gaines. a lot of things. Yes. Nick Gaines. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. And there's, there's a lot of things that people don't know. And I think I just, I can give some advice, uh, like what to, you know, what to expect, but the things we told him, because he was like, what, you know, what do I expect when I go to Romania? Um, or I guess international country, because it definitely depends from country to country and each, each one's going to be different. You're always going to have a different experience. The things that we try to staple were food, um, and water, like food and then water when we got there. But, um, we have two suitcases. One suitcase is going to be, uh, for clothes and then one's for food, uh, and water and everything we pack all the food so we have rice we have you know all the candy all the pedialyte the drinks the gatorade the soy sauce the every single carb uh, that we could have every food is packed up into the meat because you never know what you're going to get there when you expect they obviously have food when you get there i think you pay like 30 25 30 bucks a day for the food um they have like a little dinner you just never know people get sick um i got food poisoning at open nationals uh and it just you know shit happens so always come prepared um, as you're going to a different country, come with what you need. Um, so pack, I would say just pack as much food as you can. Um, and then the next thing is definitely get adjusted to the time. Uh, with whatever time you compete at, um, just get adjusted to it because last year was kind of rough for me because we stayed on uh, US time and that's just what made most sense for the meet. Uh, it didn't make sense for me to adjust because it was just so close when we got there. This time we're getting, I'm getting there almost a week in, in advance to the meet. So we're going to fully adjust to Romanian time, uh, you know, start waking up at seven to eight o'clock every single morning and then go to sleep, like, you know, find the circadian rhythm. And yeah, that's that. Um, bring chalk, bring your own chalk. Bring, yeah. Bring and then obviously powder. all the, yeah, all the, all the um, accessories, bring chalk, bring baby powder, bring your ammonia salts, you know, every single thing that you use in the gym, make sure you just throw it in your bag and also make sure you throw it in a carry on, not in a check bag. That's very important because you hear all these horror stories of, people checking their equipment it gets lost you know in turkey it gets lost in romania wherever you know they just it didn't arrive and it comes a week later and they won't have their uh lifting you know their singlet meet day they won't have their belt they're gonna have to use someone else's so always put that in the carry-on right above your head on the plane um and yeah that's that's that i mean if i, if I keep thinking of stuff i'll keep saying it yeah of course i mean and and i think the other thing is like we have a group chat going for the juniors yeah. and sub juniors, like ask questions in there. You know, if you listen to this, ask questions. Yeah. We got some elder statesmen of the game, like Shane Nutt going. And I remember talking Absolutely. to Anthony um, on the podcast, uh, shout out to our previous episode. If you want to go listen to it with that, where I interviewed Anthony and I could just tell that it was like, 
daddy Shane nut was there. So everything's going to be okay. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, um, like I could tell he's an elder statesman. Like he's been around the block. He's a, a very experienced coach. He's done international travel before things like this. And he kind of took some of the other lifters under his wing and kind of, you know, help them answer questions on, on the equip side, Luke Mellon's going to be there. And he's been many international competitions. Now he was in Turkey last year. So if you're on the equip side, um, you know, reach out to those elder lifters that have been there, done that. I think anyone that went to Turkey last year, we should have good advice for you, especially. And, um, this, this, we can only assume this competition is probably going to be better than it was yeah. in Turkey, as far as the facilities and the production and all that kind of stuff might be a wrong assumption. We'll see when we get there. <laughs> Thankfully for the classic lifters, they'll have uh, the whole week of, of equipped lifting as Guinea pigs first. And like <laughs> a lot of those big boys where, where they're going to get their food and stuff like that on the equip side. Um, they were pretty helpful last year, but yeah, like we're a team. So help each other out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I want to mention going back to Luella, uh, was that she totaled 582.5 her nominating total, um, or Chelsea's nominating total for the world championships in Romania is 540. So Mike gold back to you on this and Julia as well. If you've looked into this, um, and Julia, feel free to jump in here. If you have anything, just, you know, let us know on these, on these topics. Um, do you, where are you, where do you see this matchup falling, Mike? So, I mean, like I wrote in the uh, preview thing, I, th I think Luella is stronger. Like, I think she is the stronger lifter. But I think she's going to be affected by, by the NAPFs. I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be confident that she repeats what she just did. Mm -hmm. And Chelsea has definitely has a better deadlift um, than Luella. And has, I think, a little bit of a better bench also. And she's making good progress. And she's also just, like, she's just a, a technical, like, lifter. Like, she just, her lifts look clean. She shouldn't have yeah. any issues with the judges. They're all to the standard. So I would say Luella is the favorite. But I, I think that Chelsea has a chance. Like, I would say probably it's more like a 75-25 kind of thing. But I think there's a real chance. And where do you, where do you just looking at uh, Chelsea's training, um, she nominated as a 540, but that was, well, I guess it, that was in Scottsdale. So it wasn't that long ago. It was only like maybe two months ago. So what do you, th what do you think as far as like, where, where do you put her top in? And then Julie so, will come to you. I think, yeah. So I, I, I was thinking like 570 top end, something like that. 570. All right, Julia, what's your take? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that assessment. I think um, Luella is slightly ahead going into this. Um, however, I think that Chelsea has a chance to kind of, I mean, she can really um, peak correctly this time. And um, Luella kind of had her, her, her peak disturbed by um, NAPF. Um, however, I did, like I said, I talked to Luella's coach. Um, and he said that they trained, I think it was bench and deadlift right through. So they did not do any type of peaking, any type of tapering for bench or deadlift. Um, so that is something to be aware of. I don't think, you know, that it's going to be completely disturbed, but I would say, you know, from a preparation standpoint, um, Chelsea is, is in a better spot. Um, she does have some kilos to make up. I think it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, but, you know, this is something, you know, like Tristan said um, earlier in the show, attempt selection, warm ups, you know, having a little bit of luck on your side. These are all things that make a huge difference. And um, I think that, you know, this is going to be a battle if everybody um, comes correct, which I think they will. Um, so I'm excited to see that. I think, um, Chelsea definitely has the ability to take the bench world record. Um, I know Luella tried, I think she missed her third bench. Um, and the record is 120 kilos. Um, you know, they may both break it, but, um, yeah, I, Chelsea has the stronger, um, bench or deadlift and Luella has a stronger squat. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be to watch because it's going to be a battle of two very different lifters. 
Yeah, we're going to know early on if Luella's squat's not on, then the door will be open for Chelsea to win the world championship. Um, Alex and Mike, you guys got any things, final thoughts on that or else are there other battles you're looking forward to? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I'm ready to. Yeah. I'm ready to talk about the the interesting battles. All right, let's do it. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I, I think the, no, I think the only thing I saw with her attempts was they're just like really vastly different. Like her first attempt was first or second was like twelve and a half or fifteen, and then her second to her third was twenty five kilos or there was something like that. She took really big jumps. Um, if that works for her, that's totally okay. It's just I never I haven't seen that. I usually see like a big jump from first to second, and then a smaller jump from second to third or around the same. Um, but if that works for her, that's totally okay. Um, but the temp selection is going to be a huge part in Romania because, you know, if she missed that third squat of 265, you know, she would have been left with 245 or whatever. Two, I think, I think she took a 20 kilo job. So I think it would have been 245. She would have been left with, which is, you know, leaving a lot of kilos on the table. Um, so just being smart with the temp selection and trying to really just maximize your knowing of what you can do on the day. Yeah, she'll have, I mean, they're going to have to work out a system. It'll either be Ven and someone else. Whenever we have these battles, they're going to assign uh, one of the national team coaches to each lifter and let them battle it out, you know, with the coach, like basically like, you know, so there's not going to be any, you know, uh, sketchy stuff going on where one coach is calling both lifters and they're in a battle yeah. or anything like that. So attempt selection will be huge. Uh, making lifts will be huge. I, I think the standard is going to be a little stricter. Um, I think at the, at the NAPF, it was a lot of our refs. It was a lot of Canadian refs. Um, it felt like a little bit more like national level refereeing. I mean, it was an international yeah. competition, but there were some lifts here and there where you, where I looked and I was like, uh, oh, squat was like real borderline. And we definitely saw in Malta that they weren't getting away with anything like that. So yeah. that would be another thing too, is just if the jury or if the, um, officiating is tighter, I think that helps Chelsea a little bit as well. And, uh, I have a question. Was there a jury in, uh, NAPFs? Yeah, there was a jury. There was a jury, but, and um, sometimes, were- sometimes. Go ahead. Were they, were they being, were they being used um, or no? Not too much. Um, they were mostly being used to protest if your own lifter uh, missed a lift. I, no no okay. one was protesting made lifts by other lifters. Um, yeah. And then, and then definitely uh, the, they were watching replay. And so they would just yeah. on replay, like kind of overturn some things here. And they're mostly only a couple of times that they overturned something to, to a no lift. Okay, so gotcha. I think they were pretty generous. I mean, I know the refs that were at, at the NAPF personally really well. We were in, just in the trenches with them for what felt like a month. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, they're all super nice and like a little bit, I would say a little bit more of the easier referees. Linda McFeeders from, from uh, Canada was there. She's pretty hardcore. Um, one of the refs from Panama is pretty hardcore, but otherwise it was a good, it was a lifter friendly refing pool for sure. Yeah. So. I was going to say, um, I think Elisa uh, had a squat overturned by the Panamanian ref, or maybe it was a Costa Rican ref. I, I can't remember, but um, yeah, was squat overturned. But in general, they were they're pretty good. Um, I was actually concerned I was going to get called because of my like wonky shoulder elbow situation, and um, I wasn't. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be tighter at Worlds. It almost always is. So, yeah. 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 All right. Okay, Mike Gold, bust through some of your your battles here because I don't I know okay. uh, we're so already we'll going start, for two hours. We'll start with obviously the one that we're going to have the most inside knowledge on here. So um, it's a very interesting year. I think this is the most like the deepest weight class I've ever seen. Um, last year, Alex, you came in fifth with what was seven twenty two or seven twenty? Seven twenty. I t- I think I had a. I might even have been a three-way tie, but it was the fifth and sixth. We tied the same. I just had a lower body weight, uh, 720. Right. Yeah. So last year was interesting because it was basically there was like a f- four at the top and then you came fifth and then um, six and seven are actually like two of the top this year in nominations yeah. in uh, in Andrea and uh, Suleiman, right? So yeah. Yeah. So, but this year, like it's crazy because you're nominated in 11th with seven – 722 22. yeah yeah so there's literally meaning I, I would say i mean i don't know i don't have like full insight on all of like the all of like the 15 lifters nominated with like 715 and up but just without like any real insight there's probably gonna be like 10 people fighting for for the podium literally oh, yeah wow like i don't know some some of these people probably like are capped out at their nominations like some of them might have just hit it or whatever i don't know I know some of the lifters, some of them I don't, but realistically, 
there might be like eight lifters who total 750 plus. I don't think anyone's going to total like 800 range like last year. I don't see it, but yeah. I think in terms of just depth, I think I was, I was actually discussing this with uh, Connor also. I think we realistically will probably see something like eight lifters end up totaling 750 plus. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be so, it's going to be super deep and it's going to just, it's going to come down to, it's going to come down to a lot of just those uh, attempt selections and just like chipping each other on those attempts, like not, you know, not knowingly, but just like having that advantage of like, okay, so you're projected at 740 right now and I'm projected at 742. And then my third deadlift will get me to 760 or whatever it is. Like it's going to come down to that really nitty gritty, but it's going to be a lot of just back and forth. As long as, you know, if everyone has a day that they have, then yeah, it's going to be, you know, everyone's going to go above 750 and everyone's going to be just, it's going to, it's going to be crazy if everyone starts um, competing well and going, hitting all their lifts. But once people start missing lifts, you'll see the people that drop out and they're going to be way too far away to be pulling for that podium, pulling for that gold second, third spot, you know, top five, whatever it is. Um, It's all going to come down to hitting your lifts and staying within the pack of that top five. And just looking at those countries, like it's Italy, France, Canada, Great Britain, U S Spain, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia, so these are ballers. Like these are not countries yeah. that have like bad uh, national team coaches that are going to miss too many lifts or make a lot of mistakes. Although we did see France make some mistakes and the French head coach I, did DM power team America after saying, we'll see you at junior worlds. Uh, by the way, in I, I, actually, I don't agree on that though. I think they are. Wait, good was coaches. that, they are. Good I think coaches. Was that with Jack Jacob? Was that with Jack Jacob? Yeah. 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 So that was, that was their, that hurt that coach. Uh, he's like, I'll, we'll see you guys in Romania. for the team. <laughs> so he's, he's ready to yeah. uh, avenge himself for sure. But go ahead, Mike. Yeah. So what I was saying is I, I disagree actually. Like, I think they have like good coaching staffs, most of these countries. Yeah. I think this weight class, there's going to be a ton of missed lifts, a ton. Okay. Because, 100%, 100%. Because, because there's such like a, such a close spread from like one to 15, like nobody, the smart thing to do, is probably just to have a game plan for squat and bench and just hit your lifts and then see where you are. But I think a lot of lifters are going to be pushing to like put up a, a subtotal and they'll be like what Alex was saying. So I said there might be 10 lifters who are fighting for the podium, not that there's going to be 10 pulling for the podium. I mean, any 10 or any 12, whatever, might have a shot. There probably will only end up being five or six that make enough lifts to actually be pulling for the podium. So yeah. I, I think it's just going to be, yeah, people are going to miss. So Alex, What's your, without numbers, like just what's your game plan for this? Like obviously training's going really well. Bench is like, like looking yeah. much more than it has. Like yeah. what's your game plan to just, are you just trying to like stack some like six squats and bench and see where you're at? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really where the game plan has been always just always hitting lifts. Um, really just getting my squat um, to just have that true potential that I know where it could be, where it's like that 620, 630 range. It just needs to be there. Um, that's the biggest thing. And then just get hitting that squat um, in that range and then hitting a big bench around, you know, that, you know, like that 165 to 170 range, getting a big subtotal where I'm confident. And if I need to take two and a half to five kg less, really just making sure I hit those lifts um, because I feel like I've gotten a lot stronger, especially on bench uh, since Path to America, since junior nationals. And then just seeing where I stack up on deadlift, um, it's going to come down to good attempt selection. I might, you know, just do some changing attempts at the last, you know, second of it for deadlifts, but it's going to just hitting lifts, you know, always going nine for nine. That's what it always is. You know, just, just making sure I don't miss. Cause once I miss and I miss seven and a half kilos, you know, it's going to just put me in a bad position. Right. That makes sense. I, and I assume, I mean, I assume you're going to be, hopefully the goal eight for eight and then, the, your last deadlift comes down to placing, right? I mean, like, yeah. you don't really, at this point in your career, you're not like a new lifter, you're not, you don't care about the exact number you total. Like, your no. last deadlift. No. Like, so, this is actually, it's a little interesting situation um, compared to like previous years. Like, a few years ago, you were like one of, like, especially when you were like a teen lifter, sub junior lifter, like, you were definitely one of like, like the biggest deadlifter almost always. But here, you're in like, there's like a grouping. So, there's definitely people with smaller deadlifts, but there's also people who have like pulled. 320 plus in comp so here yeah. it's like the first time you're like like towards the top end of the middle rather than being like you're not going to be pulling last like that's i don't know yeah. where you're going to so you're not going to be able to like load an exact number for like okay this locks in that it's more like okay this gets me temporary 
gold or temporary bronze or wherever you are, yeah. depending on. So I guess even even the third deadlift is less about like just putting a random number in and more it's like you have to put in a number that you have like a level of confidence with. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. That's where it's gonna be because there is gonna be people. There's gonna be, I think, two to four guys. Uh, I mean, from where I think my delta is gonna be, I probably three to four guys pulling after me um, and loading it. At least it's good that no one's gonna be hitting the delta world record uh, or the squat world record. I don't think none of those gonna be broken. The bench world record can be taken, but um, yeah, I mean, it's really gonna be uh, just putting a number in that I think I could hit. And it's for placing and then just seeing, you know, if the other people are going to execute on their top end lifts. Hunter is so, in the chat and he's saying anything less than nine, nine for nine probably won't be enough to win. Um, and that's definitely for sure. Especially when you see these tight battles like this, he said, he's loving the show, excited to hear what everyone has to say, what they're going to think it's going to take to win. Well, we can not talk about the 83s for too much longer because we've been going for two hours and we want to get through some of these other battles um, but is there anything, final thoughts, Julia, do you have anything you wanted to weigh in on this or you want to keep it moving? Um, a lot. I think it's going to take a lot to win. Um, no, I, I mean, I think he's, you know, a hundred percent, um, correct that, it, you know, it, it's just, it's echoing what, what Mary says too, you know, make attempts and, uh, you're going to be in a better position to win. And at the world level, um, you really have to do that. It, it's not it's not optional. Um, and I think, you know, that's why, um, you know, that's a big reason why Natalie Richards came out on top, um, in what was perceived as very close battle there. So, yeah. Um, I think it's going to take nine out of nine day. I think it's going to take flawless execution, um, as it should, because this is the world championships. This is, you know, the biggest meet for juniors in the world. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's the most competitive version of it ever. Yeah. yeah. By far. It, yeah. In every weight class. So you said we should discuss some other ones. So we'll just go through some of the, like, I would say the second, um, or maybe even the most exciting, but the other one that like compares with this class is the 93s this year are just like ridiculously stacked. Yeah. Um, meaning there's uh, five people, I, six people over 800, five people like in the eight tens and up, like, what are your thoughts on that class? I've, obviously, I, you know Shane, and do you know Peyton? Like I, I think yeah, I met him. I, I didn't. You know? We, yeah. I mean, I saw him at nationals. I saw him in the drug testing room. I mean, he's he's jacked. He's. I didn't know how strong he was. I didn't know how. Um, yeah, I didn't know how he was going to be able to compete um, with Shane like that. The only thing is, I didn't. I didn't see what happened on their last poll. I didn't see. Oh, I think that was great. It seemed like, so Shane, it seemed like a little bit of misloading. Him. No, he Shane just played him. him. Yeah, so Shane loaded in like something that he had no business loading, but yeah. then like Peyton thought it was real, so Peyton like waited loaded till Shane it. took it, and Shane just loaded it and let it sit, and then Peyton had to go above it and had to pull like twenty oh, kilos yeah. extra. Like yeah, on the day, Peyton was the stronger lifter. Chloe, that's what it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. Chloe put in this this great do this great attempt, um, you know, to kind of seal the deal there at the end. So yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I I Games saw right through. I, I immediately messaged Shane. I'm like. I'm like, wow, like, is this going to work? And then it worked. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I didn't think it could possibly work because it's like, if you do any level of scouting, like, I don't know who Peyton's coach is, but like, if you do any level of yeah. scouting, if you see somebody load like 25 kilos over their like PR, like without, without having seen any sort of training or anything, like anything to like tell you that it's realistic, like it's not like he took heavier first and second attempts. Like he took his normal attempts and then just loaded and then jumped and, like 30, 30, yeah, 40 kilos. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like that's not, I mean, but like, he's not, I mean, I'm sure he's competed before, but like he's never competed at like international or even nationally. I don't think Peyton. So he's a little inexperienced, yeah. like just playing the game. So that's something you learn, but, but you always, you always learn that. And that's what he's going to, that's what he learned there. And then now he knows that for worlds and he's going to IPF worlds now. So yeah. Right. And, and he'll, he'll have he'll US probably national have, team coaches handling. Yeah. He'll yeah. probably get in because Shane calls his own numbers. So yeah, me and Shane are going to, we're going to have um, Craig uh, handling us. He's going to be one of the he's helpers. Craig. He's, um, he's, 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 uh, do you know Jess McKinney? Jess Kinney? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Craig Lemieux. He's, is it? Yes. Ke Craig Lemieux. Oh, yeah. oh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lemieux he's going to be, he's going to be helping. He's going to be helping me, Shane. I think maybe even Anthony. I'm not sure about Anthony, but I know he's going to be helping me and Shane. Okay. Gotcha. So, gotcha. yeah. 
Um, Carolyn Connor is in the chat as well. Um, <laughs> she's not in the room. No. Oh, she's not. No, she's not with me. Uh, no. Too bad we would have her on Two instead weeks. of you in a heartbeat. But you, yeah. you, you answered the message right away. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, but uh, all right. So, uh, other thoughts on the ninety threes? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a great battle. I can't wait to watch it. That's the biggest thing. I was going to say that. I we were talking about NAPFs, but I wanted to wait till we got to Junior Worlds. Like, I can't wait to just watch everyone compete, Shane and Payton, and then obviously um, Nathan Javau. I hope I didn't mess up his last name, but he's one of my friends from Great Britain. Can't wait to watch all of them. And then obviously the winner last year, um, the Swedish, uh, the Swedish Bull, uh, Lou Young. Can't wait to watch yeah. him too. It's gonna be a great. It's gonna be a great battle. And I just um, wait. And after don't, I don't forget about the French sub junior Malik. Last year, oh yes, he's yeah. one of the biggest he's junior total insane. ever, and now he's moving up. Not moving up. I'm saying he's now he's yeah. a junior. I've I've it's known crazy. that kid for like four years now. He's uh I've, he's been powerlifting since he's like 12 years old. He's absolutely he's a beast. He's insane. He's crazy. Um, I can't wait to watch. You know, I can't wait to support the American team and just watch there. And after I compete, just just support and give back. You know, my my love to the community and powerlifting. For sure, Julia. Anything you want to add? No, um, you know, just that battle at nationals was one of the craziest, most unexpected battles um, of the entire competition. Um, yeah. It's always, it's really cool to see um, these powerlifters, um, you know, these new people come out of um, nowhere or, you know, um, who are basically unknown to us, come in and challenge um, really good lifters and keep them on their toes. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, um, wild that uh, Malik has been lifting since he was 12. I didn't actually yeah. know that. I mean, that you, we were talking earlier before the um, the podcast or the show went live about, you know, why sometimes these European countries have really, really good junior lifters that seem to be ahead of the US. And um, one thing I said is that, and I don't know how true this is, and it, it could not be um, at all, but um, they really start, they go into powerlifting as their sport. Um, and I think, you know, we do have people who start lifting at 12 now, um, and it's becoming increasingly more common, but we definitely have a tendency um, uh, to view powerlifting as like a secondary sport that, you know, we take up after we're done our main sport in high school or college. Um, so I think that that's a major difference. Yeah, you're uh, a perfect example, Alex, with soccer. I think yeah. it's because in America, like high school sports is culture is like so big. So like if you're playing soccer or you're playing football or you're playing basketball, like you are like the celebrity in the school. So like people that are like good <laughs> athletes entering high school, like they focus on sports. Like they're not like, yeah. I mean, they might go to the gym to lift also, but like sports is like the big thing. But like, I don't, I don't know so much about like European uh, school culture, but like, as far as I know, like soccer is the only really big sport there. So like if you're yeah. I mean, some people are just not great at soccer. So if, like you're not great at soccer, it's not like you have five other options that are like yeah. also just as big. For sure. And yeah. just real quick, uh Peyton Johnson, uh just he comes from Reno, Nevada. He trains at American Iron Gym. Um, that's one of our big supporter gyms that hosts meets for Power in America. So definitely um, you know, shout out to American Iron Gym out there in Reno, Nevada, where they'll be helping a big role in hosting the classic open classic national championships next year. All right. What's the next battle or Alex, did you have something else you want to say? Sorry. Uh, no. You, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. All right, Mike, take us away. What's next. So in terms of actual battles, so like, I mean, these next two aren't really as big battles, but the other two um, classes on the men's side where we have our top lifters are obviously the one Oh fives with Anthony. But for me, this is actually interesting because to me, the real battle it's not a direct battle. It's what it's Hamza versus Anthony. Hamza yeah, and Sub Junior. Yeah. The kid is absolute. In, he's insane. Like last year, he was strong. This year, he's like totaling like I think he just put up like 880 in the gym with more. Like the kid's gonna. I don't think he'll probably. He probably won't total 900, but like he's definitely. He's definitely like it's definitely possible as a Sub Junior when like <laughs> the Sub Junior record for any weight class is like 800, and he's like knocking at 900. Yeah, it's crazy. So that's gonna. Be I hard. think it's def I, I think with him, I think it's definitely gonna see. Like, I think he went. I was watching his meet, um, 
and he, I think he did 820 at the meet. So he didn't go all out at the meet. Obviously, it was clear that he didn't go all out. So it's going to see, like, how much his top strength will be at the meet and how much – I think he water cuts a bit. Um, so how much, you know, he's going to be affected by the water cut and travel because I know he's from Austria. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see. If he can go above 870, I would be – that would be great. And that, that battle with Anthony – well, that side battle, I guess, not you know, right. direct battle, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Austria is like a pretty, pretty good travel. Like, it's only like like a two hour flight. Yeah, know? yeah, it's not gonna be bad. And I know Anthony wanted to battle with Coco again, but I don't. Coco I just didn't go to Worlds. Yeah, it's it's like kind of disappointing, but now it's like yeah, now it's inter- it's interesting for Anthony now because like he really gets the choice to like like do whatever he wants. I mean, it's I mean yeah. obviously there are other lifters and there might be somebody who puts up something like bigger than expected, but like yeah, there's the opportunity to like. I guess like call it overshoot, like take stuff that you wouldn't take if you had to worry about another lifter and like theoretically try to put up like a statement. Like, I mean, he's he's one of the best, he has potential to be one of the best open one Oh fives in the world. So hundred percent. Yeah. He's insane. He's, he is great lifts. And Coco's best total is eight ninety five, And that was from euros. Um, and he also did that in Turkey last year as well. So yeah, if Anthony can go over 900, he would solidify himself, you know, as the best in that, in that age group and weight class. So that would be awesome. Yeah. I'm sure he'll be pushing for that. I know 900 has been a, a big, uh, he already broke. Didn't he already total exactly 900? Yeah. I, I don't think he cares about 900. He wants more. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> if he can bury that what's... total by Coco by 15 kilos, that would be sick. It would he wants at least 2K. Bad taste at least 2K. Oh. 9075 is 2K. At least, at least 2K. What's the world record? Uh, eight ninety five, I think. Oh, eight ninety five. Okay. He, he, he has the Coco has the world record squat, and he should break that on a good day. Yeah. Uh, the world record bench is two thirty three and a half. Like Anthony's bench is also like right there. So yeah, he, theoretically, right there. you could take the squat bench in total. So. Yeah. Julia, what were we gonna say? You were trying to say something. Oh no, I was just gonna say I think he had some goals. Um. A while back, I think we talked about him possibly totaling into like the nine, the teens, like nine yeah. fifty. Oh, he didn't say that stuff. We said that. Yeah, yeah. We said it. it and I kind of coaxed him in the episode, the interview that I interviewed him. I was like, he was kind of talking about the best numbers, and I was adding it up in my head. And I was like, so we're talking like nine twenty, right? <laughs> um, but of course, we like to gas up our guy. That's our guy, McDouble. Um, and everyone loves him, so <clears throat> hopefully, he'll ball out and get that bad taste out of his mouth from Turkey. Yeah. So, Mike, what's the and next then, one? Yeah. Well, the other class that, like, I'm co- very, very confident and got more confident today in bringing the goal yeah. is 56s. I mean, Kyle is, like, he's, he's on a tear. Um, he's yeah. coming with, like, a big nomination lead, but uh, I was actually – shout out to Ish because we were discussing this class, and he was showing me um, – uh, I think his name is Taiga or something, um, the Japanese lifter who was nominated in second – so he is also training well. So he's like pushing like 660 plus in the gym. So he's way above his nomination. But um, I mean, with a 700 pound deadlift, right? We're going to, you get a lot of room there. He's going to obviously, I mean, he's going to be way above the, the junior world record deadlift is like 288. So he could like literally open with it potentially. Yeah. Or at least for sure second. Um, and I, if he wants to, I mean, I think there's a good chance he locks it up before his third deadlift, but if he wants to, he can easily take the open world record deadlift, right? 300.5 from Brian. So I think that's there. And then the junior total record is like 687 or something. And I think that's possibly in play. Um, so real it's... quick, just for people who are listening, we're talking Kyle Nowak in the 66s. If you look on our Instagram story, we, re- we reposted his PR deadlift today, 700 pounds, 317.5 kgs. What, go take a look at it. Judge for yourself. It moves pretty quick. It looks pretty much to the standard to me. What do you guys think? What do you think? Did Julia, uh, did you see it? Yeah, I, I thought it looked it looked good to me. Um, I didn't see anything that you know was a red flag or anything. I definitely have seen people pull um, – lifts or, or hit squats uh, close to the end of prep and you know kind of count it as a gym PR and you you know like nothing close to that is going to be reached on the platform um I didn't get that feeling here um I think he is really trying to um train to the standard he's going to have to hit so Mike 
Yeah, I disagree. Um, I mean, I, I think this was a great sign, but first off, it was pound plates and it, the lockout looked a little soft. I, I don't think he's pulling 700 like that. It's not happening, but I think Alex, this like, hold on, hold on, Alex, what's your take? No, I mean, I, he is correct, but the only thing is I can rebuttal with that is he's always pulled on pound plates going into every single meet and especially the the meet when it was, you know, two years ago when he pulled for the win at Nationals. He was, he was always, he's always been training on pound plates um, and it doesn't seem that pound plates affects him that much. You know, he's always on an OPB and pound plates. I don't think that's a problem as long as he knows that he could adjust on the day and he adjusts to the feel of kilos. I don't think it's a problem at all. He's always, he's always, he's always been on pound plates. So yeah, for the- that's true. But uh, I don't think he's like hit like all time PRs um, in comps. Like, he, well, he didn't. He, what did he do at um, Nashville? He did three hundred point five. Three hundred two. Three hundred two. Yeah, I mean that's. I think I think he had hit more in the gym, and like um, at like university worlds or whatever it's called, he missed his second and third deadlifts there. Um, on, he like, was training with a lot of straps. He was doing he was doing a lot with straps as yeah. well, and I've noticed that yeah. this prep he's taking his top singles a lot with not without straps, and same thing going into nationals, um, yeah. this year and the taper. He was talking about it in his, I don't know if we, do we do a press conference? I think we did a press conference or at least I interviewed him with my phone. Um, and he said, you know, the taper was absolutely flawless for him. So if they run back that with the same strategy and he peaks, well, hopefully this 700 could fall clean. Um, hopefully he won't need it and he can yellow it if necessary and get it up at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, mean, I don't he's... think like, I don't think he's like way below this. Like, it's not like something like you should, what uh, Julie was saying is right. Like you see lifters that like do lifts that are like super sketchy where like they're nowhere near it. I don't think that, I just think like realistically more like three ten something like that. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, I agree. And Which would still be I, an I mean, eight and a half kilo PR. So yeah. Seven yeah. Also I think like, I think like if, if he like doesn't miss like multiple squats and bench, like, like if he's even like seven for eight or six for, Probably even six for eight coming into his third deadlift. It might not He's matter. Fine. For eight yeah. for sure. So I th- I think he'll be able to load whatever he wants. I Meaning like he can load if he wants to load for the world record deadlift. If he wants to load for the for the junior world record hold, like wh- whatever like his like personal goal is, like other than winning, I think he'll yeah. probably have that opportunity. I have a question. So do, does anyone know why he he always trains on pound? plates is there like a, a preference that's just his gym it I does mean, better on instagram <laughs> Boom, saying he's like an, old saying the he's thing. Like an influence. i'm saying that's what he is like like i mean i don't, I don't know, know if his gym has kilos i just i don't think his gym because i've seen I him train in kilos know. and it's not this it's not the same gym that he trains at i've seen him squat on kilos i think he just squatted 485 on kilos um or 470 for whatever it was but it was it looked like a different facility different gym I think yeah. just he has two different gyms in Ohio that he trains at, and one's pound plates and one kilos. And yeah, maybe he does like training on pound plates or deadlifts, but yeah, I mean it works for him. Yeah, I mean I don't recognize the gym um, that he's trained, like yeah. the pound plates gym. Um, well, it would make sense if it's not a, if it doesn't actually have kilos. Exactly. It's not a pound plate yeah. Gym, but yeah. Bonus um, yeah, that I, um, his Instagram is has a ton of juice and has blown up, so that's good for him. Um, all right, what other battles we got? Because 66, or what other things are you looking forward to at the World Championship? Let's let Mike keep running down his list, and then we'll we'll go to you two um, at the end, Alex and Julia. Okay, so... What else just, you got, Mike? So the other things, let's see. So we just went through the... Um, the 93s, the 105s. Okay, so then... Um, okay, so sub-juniors, actually, will be really entertaining. Um, they're, like, start with, like, the 66s, um, Daniel Harris... The kid is like insane. Um, he's like making progress on every lift. He's he's gonna be really entertaining to watch. Okay. Um, I think he might break the total world record. And I mean, I don't know. I, have to, I don't have the nominations in front of me. Let me check. Um, His big thing is always, um, you know, squatting high. Um, but yeah, he's nominated. He's second, right? Five, five seventy-two, five. Yeah. So he's not in second. Um, I mean, it's gonna be a battle, but yeah, he his squats often are a little high. Uh, his bench pauses are not necessarily there, which is why I won't, I wouldn't like base his uh, expected total off his gym total at all. Um, so he's but I nominated think he, as a sixty-six. Okay, yeah, that's right. 
No, he is a six. He's a light 66. He's like okay, 63 gotcha. or something. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, just supposed to about that. But um, so I don't think he is not, I don't think he's not going to replicate his gym total just because everything's like a little sketchy, but his gym total is high enough, like above where he's nominated that I think he's like going to potentially like go for the sub junior total world record and um, should have a shot of winning. So I think that'll be interesting. And then the 74s, that will be really interesting. So Alex, yeah. you said you, you bumped into Nick. Uh, yeah, he doesn't yeah, yeah. yeah, we talked about it. He hasn't post, so uh, we don't know. But like, I, I was when I was like looking through like the stuff, um, I looked even at old stuff and I saw his. Uh, he pulled like a, I think it was like six hundred up for a pause single or something like that. Yeah. Like, and it looked it was like an RP like six. It was like something yeah. ridiculous. And he pulled what did he pull at nationals? It was two fifty nine, two fifty nine, and now he's like pulling two seventy two paused easily. So yeah, he's gonna shatter like. He's gonna shatter the world record there. Yeah, um, I think that'll be that'll be an interesting class because um, he's nominated in second right after Jack Reynolds, so we got one and two in that class, and they're kind of like polar opposites. Like Jack Reynolds, like he's like strong, but like um, his squats are like a little sketchy. His his bench is really really strong, but like it doesn't really pause usually. A lot like, of I, I remember seeing like a year ago he did like this like circus four hundred five bench. Which like obviously, I, like he not that he thought was a real bench, but like he just like he has the strength. Just like I don't know what he could hit like on the platform, maybe like one sixty five, something like that. Like what did he? What did he hit at nationals? So at nationals, he hit one fifty five point five. He he put he posted a one sixty five bench uh, this week. That was like that was like close, like um, maybe a, a little bit of a short pause, but like it wasn't touch and go. So. Yeah, he, he's in that range. So he definitely put, um, and then he, he had a, uh, uh, I think it was a two sixty five, a two sixty five deadlift, which is twenty four kilos more than he hit at national. So he's putting he's putting a lot on his total, but he's gonna need to because yeah. because um, Nick's gonna put an insane amount. Like I, I I think Nick's putting like I literally think he's gonna put like near fifty kilos on his total. Yeah, he's, what, we what I was talking to him. And, yeah, go well, on. I can't speak too much on it because you know, and don't want to reveal the game plan. But uh, he's looking really strong. He's he was showing me some training and the numbers that he's you know hitting in training. He's looking extremely strong. Um, and all I can really say is he's just going to be ready to go for the battle with Jack. I mean, it's going to be a USA versus USA battle. So that's going to be hype. Um, but yeah, he's gonna he's gonna definitely be ready. He's looking very strong. Yeah, there's also there's a French lifter also who's um strong that like hasn't doesn't post. Um, okay, I've been told he's like doing stuff, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Nick, like I have Nick as like a pretty decent favorite just based off like what I'm expecting. But yeah, I think and he's going to be the there. higher delta. He's he's going to be the bigger puller. So I always, oh, I'm not always go against for the bigger puller, but he's going to be, you know, he's going to be pulling to that that big range, probably a good a good bit ahead of Jack. Yeah. All right. So I Mike, know. give us some more highlights for junior worlds um, uh, that are on your list. So let's not go through every one because we can't do a full weight class by weight class. <laughs> Uh, breakdown here. Alex is already like, I promised 30 minutes and you guys are already like making me stay on here forever. No, you're good, um, you're good. If anyone has a bounce, just let us know. And, and it's, it's, it's totally fine. Um, but, but what are some of the other big highlights that you're looking for there, Mike? So I guess I'll, I'll stick with, okay. So we obviously got, we got the 69s, which is the most stacked class, like in juniors happens to be, it's a little disappointing. I was looking at the nominations and we're missing some of the like 69s at euros 69 juniors at Euros was the best battle I've ever seen. And a couple of them are not coming to Romania, which is a little disappointing. But like, well, isn't still, it because they're aged out? No, no. Uh, so the ones I'm talking about are not aged out. Uh, one of them uh, quit powerlifting because oh. they got, they, yeah, they were upset about the jury or something. I was actually having a conversation with them. Like, they, they, oh, somebody, who, oh. they somebody who totaled like 5'10 or something. So somebody who was like re- like temporarily had the world record total and got was like a so she quit. She, she, yeah. What? Was it the like she's like Lithuanian or like some northern European country? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And she she quit because she didn't like what the jury said. Uh so she was upset about the judges, then the jury, and then like the whole drug testing thing. A lot of things. There was like a, a lot of stories. It was great. Uh, it was made for a lot of entertainment. 
because she, she was freakishly strong and like okay. she like intentionally didn't take chips and did whatever i don't know but either way so, so alex she, she no go ahead mike yeah uh, so she's but... not showing up and then um somebody else moved up to the 76s so that's another one who's not back so let's, battle, get, but... let's get alex's take on the 69s real quick yeah He's... i mean he probably can't reveal all the information but whatever he but could. it's okay but tell us <laughs> give us a breakdown yeah i mean um there's three girls ahead of carolyn and it's gonna be fun because uh just just regarding the circumstances i'm this i'm actually gonna be handling her and you know i'm gonna be the coach obviously we're gonna have the the head coaches there but i'm gonna be her like personal coach on the side and last year we didn't do this just because of how close it was like she was the last session on thursday and then i was the first session on friday now it's like she's the first session on thursday and i'm the first session on friday it's a 24-hour difference so i'm gonna be handling her just like i did at nationals and it's gonna be awesome i mean it's just gonna be great um she's looking she's looking extremely strong she just like the amount of progress she's made in the past, you know, since literally March of 2022 is absurd. Like she's put on, she's put on 90 kilos, but it's going to be more than that at, um, at worlds. She's going to be since worlds to worlds, it's going to be almost hundred kilos. Um, cause we're looking to push past that 500 mark and she's looking really strong. Um, yeah, I don't want to give away too much, but that's fine. Uh, the squat world record is too low. So we're going to change that. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, She's looking. She's every all three lifts are just going really good right now. So I'm excited to bat to battle with the two French girls, and then I think the other girl is Italian. Everyone's looking strong. I mean, they're all, they're going to come in um, all strong. It's just you know the battle of execution, and we see shit. Sorry, we see some of the other lifters, and you know some of them are squatting high in training. You know, we just want to make sure we're executing in training, doing all the lifts to standard, um, all the comp pauses for bench, just executing to standard, so we don't have to have a hiccup on the platform hiccup on Mite, and yeah i'm just you know really proud of her and i'm excited to see what she's going to do and handle her yeah she's uh basically like one of the most decorated lifters in power team america she's never competed at a local meet she <laughs> only does nationals and international competitions and pretty much if you look at her open powerlifting, she adds like 30 kilos to her total um or more um every single competition so uh she total 483 at nationals at junior nationals in scottsdale um is that right yeah junior no, four seven four seventy point five. Oh yeah i'm sorry that's her dots i'm sorry 470 470.5 so if she's gonna add 30 tequilas so she'll be right there um knocking on 500 which is a big total um for a junior and especially a young junior like she just aged into juniors in that right like she's yeah she's 19 uh, uh last year was her last well, year she, she was got a, the yeah. thing last year so that was her that was yeah so, yeah, so that's huge. Um, and so, I mean, she's, she's on pace to be like the highest level lifter of all time here, never doing a local meet, only doing internationals and nationals. So it's really cool. She's saying in the chat, she's saying, Shh, be quiet. Don't say anything. So, but um, we already got it. We already got it. Carolyn, sorry. We know you're going to break the squat world record. And you're going to break 500 kilo total. So these other ladies will have to um, up their game for sure or be on their game if they want any chance of hanging with you there. But all right, any other battles, any other things that you guys are looking forward to? Major highlights here. Um, we can't get too far into the nitty gritty because because we do need to end this uh, episode here before too much uh, longer. So I guess and I, we got one other topic we want to talk I'll about. With one last one. Um, okay. The 57 sub juniors, uh, Eleni. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. She's like looking insanely strong right now she's nominated like a few kilos in second like she's like maybe five behind but um she's gonna shatter the world record deadlift like she pulled the uh, 402 the other day in the gym um the world record's like i don't know like 160 something so she's gonna likely open above it um i think vin actually might have told me that she is or not i don't remember if he said that but i think she's gonna open above it I think that's going to be a great class. She is – she's going to put up, like, a massive total probably probably somewhere – like, probably maybe into the 400s, which is, like, pretty crazy for a 57 sub-junior. And I think she is probably, in my opinion, the most likely um, person on the female side to take home a gold. So I think, I think she's definitely going to be very interesting to watch. Well, in the in the sub juniors, I mean, in, in, in any yeah any class, I think she's gonna be the most likely female to take on a gold. I mean, besides the supers, 
or besides. Oh, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Well, I already take it for granted that we won gold and silver there. You're right. Yeah. Um, I'll throw Jessica Haggerty into the mix in the 52s. Uh, she's a superstar that nobody knows about uh, because she's apparently not allowed to post her training at all. Um, but she is. Not, what do you mean? Not, when you say not allowed to, what do you mean? By her coach, uh, doesn't doesn't allow her to post anything, even like RPE five sets of five on bench, like last yeah. seventh to last warm ups, nothing. Um, but yeah, so she she's a stud and she's, she performed really, really well at high school nationals. And she's been in working in darkness since then. And this total is super old that she's nominated with a 327, and, and she's absolutely a stud. So I think that she's, she's probably going to win the gold medal as well. She's in a tight battle. She you know, nominated five kilos apart from first place. So that'll be a fun one to watch as well. Um, okay. So Mike's list is done. Julia, is there any other ones that you want to add? No, I mean, I think um, that basically covers it i think maybe the 84s we have um oh my god why am i blanking um, and tara and tara jackson on tara jackson's nominated third she's yeah. nominated a good ways behind second and, and first though yeah not i i guess we should met jessica kenny she's a killer she's yes. awesome yeah problem is there's the the french girl who is insane there so i think she's gonna take second but that she'll put up something surprising because she's she she makes progress meet to meet so yeah she'll uh i mean for for the us side as far as interest is concerned definitely the rematch between daisy and joy is big um to see you know just that battle between the two americans I, we can see that they're both nominated a little far down uh, daisy in 7th and joy in ninth. they're both pretty young joy especially is like just aging into juniors so she was a sub junior obviously she's been hitting prs left and right about throwing down huge benches now her deadlift and her squat are coming along as well we don't see as much out of daisy as far as posting is concerned but we know that this age group makes a lot of progress but that'll be a fun battle between two americans to see who finishes for uh finishes higher in the rankings um even if even if it might be difficult for either to get on the podium but we just never know um any other ones then alex you got uh, any other ones I that think, you're looking forward to no. i think that's yeah i think that's it all right um i just want to mention because I just want to hit over on the equip side a couple here. And I'm not sure, Mike Gold, have you looked at any of them? No, I, I don't know what equip is. So yeah, I don't know. Either. So I definitely want to mention like Ava Polini. She's lifting on both classic and equipped. Um, she's she's a star. She's super young, sub junior in the sport. Uh, Mackenzie Wells and the sub juniors as well has been making good progress. Catherine Cargill, sub junior, 69 kilo. I'm going to have her on the podcast. She has a legit chance of winning it. Um, and then on the uh, junior side, we've got uh, some returning legends here in Jasmine Barlow and Lola Sh Sharame, who were there last year. Um, and then also the basically one of the hottest juniors out right now is Bella Vargas um, from Texas. And she puts up big numbers. And um, so I was talking with the junior coach, John Burford in, in the Cayman islands. And he specifically mentioned Catherine Cargill and Bella Vargas are probably uh, our best chances there. And they're going to do something special. Um, and then on the men's side, I do want to mention um, we've got the monster chase Lawton in the one Oh fives. I think all of these were these all sub juniors last year, Alex, can you remember? Yeah. They were all in yeah, chase, chase. yeah. Chase was there. Last and year. they're all moving up into the juniors. So it's going to be tough yep. battles there. Um, but also, um, Arayo, I remember him in, uh, Arayo Saniola is a, a sub junior one Oh five. I remember him at high school nationals. He's crazy strong and super young as well. Um, and there's just a bunch of them over here on the, on the, uh, Nick, like for instance, Nicholas Caldonia sub junior, super strong. I'm not looking at where they're nominated. I'm just like rolling through our roster here, but these guys all have a good shot. Um, Jordan Coomer in the, in the chat, uh, the Cargills, they're the strongest family in the state of Georgia. Um, they do a lot for the sport in Georgia. They're going to be hosting meets for us down there. And pretty much uh, the, her, her older brother, Andrew was in, uh, the Cayman islands handling as well. And Kat is definitely like the star of the family. So, um, I'm going to get her on the podcast for sure. Um, I'm going to get Bella Vargas on the podcast as well. And then we'll be doing our whole thing with the media team in Romania. So we'll be doing 
Uh, we'll be trying to do pre-comp press conferences. We'll be doing pre-game shows. We'll be doing post-comp press conferences. I'll be interviewing people in between disciplines with my phone and posting on Instagram stories, all that kind of stuff. So while we're out there, you know, you'll get to know some of these other equipped lifters as well. I think our equipped team just overall um, is pretty strong here. Let me let me pull this back up real quick. Um, we have we're fielding a full, we're fielding fourteen on the men's side and sixteen a full a full squad on the on the women's side. Um, so we, we're one of the few out there that will have a full squad on, on the women's side on for equipped as well. So, um, Karen, Wen is on there, a Marty Ego's lifter, she's always like one of the most fun people. So definitely some people that you want to check out for sure. So, um, all right, that pretty much wraps it up then for junior and sub junior worlds. Unless Julia, you got anything or anyone else have final thoughts on this? Um, well, I just think, um, it's, it's pretty cool to see our, our equip side, um, doing so well and having so many stars there um i think there's a lot of credit to john burford there um i know in the past um like the european countries have been uh dominant on the equip side ukraine especially um and we've been seeing a lot of lifters come over from equip and dominate in raw you know um at the open level so uh it's you know, pay attention to the equip side because you could be seeing these names um, on both both equipped and raw down the road. Um, they could be a threat. Um, so yeah, just looking forward to that. For sure. All right, then let's uh, move into our final topic here. And Alex, if you got to go, you know, feel free to bounce. Um, but I think this is gonna be kind of a fun one. Um, we wanted to talk about breaking news and there's, you know, current events, so-called, which you know, obviously we already hit on the North American powerlifting championships. That's definitely the biggest uh, news that's happening this week as far as international comps are concerned. Um, but Brandon Petrie went on the King of the Lifts podcast and released uh, another banger of an episode. And I definitely wanted to talk about it a little bit. He, a couple of the highlights that he mentioned, I'll just run through real quick and then we'll get your all's take on this. We can get into a talk about it. Um, he said that there's a lot more people coming over to powerlifting America than we know about uh, and, that, yeah. and that we are expecting. It's not just some of the big names, but it's a lot of, it's a lot more lifters than, than um, the big names that people are mentioning often. He had a quote on there that, you know, they, he's talking about, the future of the sport. And he says the IPF is the future of the sport is like an exact quote from him, which I think is really cool to see that now him and Russ have both kind of mentioned where they've seen what the IPF is doing. They're seeing what power thing America is doing and they like it. And that's a big part of the reason why they're coming over. Um, he's got a ton of ideas about media stuff. A lot of it is stuff that we're already doing. We're talking about pregame shows, um, doing yeah. interviews with in, interviews with the athletes before. I think we all kind of thought that Sheffield kind of uh, m- missed an opportunity by having a 30 minute countdown timer instead of having a, a desk with Matt Gary sitting at it since he was sitting right there in the front row, you know, and some other superstars like Sophia Ellis was sitting there and Jurens was there, could have brought those three up, put them on a desk, put a mic on them and, and uh, t- did a pregame show. That's something that yeah. we were doing. Um, which I, which I went, you know, we did that in Malta. We're going to try and do that with all of our live streams going forward for all of our nationals and stuff like that. Um, but what, what I want to see happen is for that to be incorporated into the main live broadcast. So in Malta and in Romania, we're going to be running our own little side YouTube stuff that we're doing, um, for our lifters, but I would like to see that stuff in the main broadcast. And I just talked back and forth to Petrie and the DMS a little bit, and we kind of reached the conclusion. That's like, it's great that we're doing it, but we need the IPF and uh, the other, you know, our national meets and the other regional meets like the NAPF to adopt this stuff into the, just, just the, the standard for broadcast, which it is in every other sport, like literally no other sport comes on and says, you know, like, like, turns on the camera and right at kickoff for before a football game without telling yeah. you anything before it, even, even on a one o'clock game on, on a, just a, any Sunday during NFL season, when there's eight or nine games happening all at once, they at least go to the booth for like a little bit of a pregame show, at least a five minute pregame show. And then of course they have the studio pregame show that's going on for an hour before as well. So it's like just stuff like this. So we got to incorporate it. The other question we, uh, that we, you know, I kind of DM'd with them a little bit about is just, is the media and power thing soft? He wants to hear uh, more yeah. raw emotional reactions. Like people ha- be required to do press conferences after a tough yeah. loss, like you do in 100%. any sport. Um, and then the media the, definitely soft. 
And then the last one was just, and then we'll go on all these topics, especially this one. Uh, but yeah, should powerlifting feds get more involved in creating rivalries like other federations do? Like the NFL will like explicitly like troll a team with the schedule, like they, making you have to like go against like, like Aaron Rodgers probably has a game against the Packers early in the season, you know, where you have no, to. The NFL actually doesn't do that. The NFL, the schedule is preset. No, they definitely do it. They definitely do no, it for no. sure. You they know they have flex. You they play every, no, no, they don't. You play every division every three years. You play. The yeah, teams but the as far as what year. they put on TV, there's no. Uh, oh yeah, they, they yes, they will definitely troll, TV, but not not the schedule. And they they definitely hyped. They've definitely hyped and built the rivalries up within the divisions. So then you're going to get two of those games a year and stuff like that. But but so the question is, okay, let's say we're powerful in America, which we obviously are. Um, like the NFL and like the UFC. They're the organizing bodies for those sports. They set up situations for there to be rivalries and for there to be conflicts amongst people within their own fed. Obviously, in 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 UFC, you know, they do the live press conferences before in front of a live audience and you know get people to talk shit to each other and stuff like. Do should we do more stuff like that? So overall, these are the topics from the Patreon episode that I, that I had made note of. Um, let's start off with IPF is the future of the sport. What's y'all's quick take on that? Because I think it's all pretty much unanimous. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, like everyone, not everyone, but I can't, say, can't speak for everyone, but a lot of the top names that have seen what Sheffield has done, have seen what the IPF is becoming. And I think it's really just um, like just recency bias where they they saw the split from the USAPL and IPF. And then um, they just kind of saw there was kind of like this kind of missed time of just not doing much and they're like oh the pro series is going to be so good in um usapl and it really didn't end up being that good then sheffield finally came in 2023 because i've been profiting for four years and i was going to go to sheffield in 2020 um the first one or like the the one that was going to be in 2020 and people would kind of refer were forgetting about sheffield and this big event this big cash money meet the biggest meet of all meets um and then it finally came to fruition in 2023 and then now everyone wants to go back to ipf it's kind of just about what's hot in the moment, what was hot there. And it was the USAPL for about a year or two. And now that the USAPL split, now Property America is the Fed to be in to get to the IPF. Everyone's commuting back to the Property America. So you have all the you know top guys, you know, you have Russ, Petrie, um, and then we, you know, there's talks of Ashton and Bob coming over. And I was actually talking to someone today about there's there's just the debate of like well if you're gonna total 900 kilos in IPF and then you know the guy totals a thousand USAPL like are you really gonna say you're the strongest in IPF and I'm just like it's just two different ballparks and I just think all the lifters should be in Power of the America and the IPF because it's the federation to be in there's nothing really I see that's the USAPL is doing for the lifters um, Power of the America is for the lifters it's innovating with the you know the press conferences and just everything that's just in the path to me it's just doing it correctly. And then obviously the, you know, it goes to IPF worlds where you have the best commentators there, you know, you have the best live streams and then you obviously have the most pinnacle path to event, which is Sheffield, you know, competing for that, um, you know, getting to that stage is just, is just insane to me. And then I know hopefully in a few years I will get there, but yeah, I mean, everyone is coming to path to America. Everyone's going to, everyone wants to be back in IPF. Um, and they just, you know, they kind of, we're just late to the party. I saw this back in, you know, 2022. I was the first almost, I mean, I was member 299. I was right on Path the America. I was like, yep, I want to go to Worlds because that's been my dream since I was 15, 16 years old. And, you know, I joined Path the America right away and I've been on the world teams. This is my second time now. So I'm excited for it and excited for more people to switch over. Yeah. And then now with world games going raw as well, I mean, oh, yeah. also for like for university athletes, they have this organization called Fizu, which runs like a university Olympics that every other year, the, the university world cup is going to be sanctioned by Fizu to be a part of the Fizu world championships, which gets the universities involved, which hopefully will bring some money involved into university powerlifting where there'll be scholarships and things because it's sanctioned by a IOC recognized organization in Fizu. So like, that's a huge thing to be like a couple of steps, you know, just right below uh, university Olympics. Um, and then obviously, you know, world games is at that level as well. So yeah, there's a lot over here. Um, we have the NAPF championships. We're hosting it in Scottsdale next year. So, you know, the production is going to go up, um, the year after that it's in Jamaica. Then they just voted. It's going to be in Belize. So these are all great places, uh, to, to visit as well. Um, what other thoughts do you guys have about, uh, the stuff that's, 
we um i mentioned from petrie um about, what do you think about the live broadcast stuff julia so, oh yeah Sorry. go ahead mike she's saying okay <laughs> No, go for it. Because you were, you were, you were instrumental in uh, bringing that to world. So yeah. Oh no, he's talking. Wait, what are you talking? Oh. About? Talking, about the... sorry, talking just about right. the general yeah. ideas of, that he has about pushing the media forward. Some of the stuff is stuff like pregame shows okay. and stuff that we're doing. Yes, yeah, so I would say in general, there's two things with media. One thing that I don't like, even with like the best announcers in the world, is that um, I think the media's job is to be a little bit more interactive, meaning. I see too much like waiting 30 seconds, before, like being non-committal in calls and stuff like that. Like when you're announcing, right, people are watching it, but a lot of people that are watching either don't know powerlifting super well or, or don't have a great understanding of judging or whatever. They want to listen to a commentator, like say, oh, I think that was a good lift or I think, it's or this is why that, like, you can't be a hundred percent politically correct and be a, the best commentator you could be at the same time. Like you there's a line. Obviously, you don't want to cross the line. I don't know where exactly the line is, but like, there's there's too much being non-committal. I think, like in general, like I'm not I'm not talking about any specific announcers. I'm talking about all announcers. There's mm -hmm. way too much. Like, okay, squats. Let's see what the judges say. Like, you, you could say, say what in, you power, think. in power thing. Yeah, like you could say yeah, what you I think. What you like, sometimes you'd be like, you. There's nothing wrong with saying like, oh, that looked high, and then like if the judges say good, be like, oh, I'm surprised, or or I think or saying. I think the judges made a bad call. Like there's, there's no, like in every other sport, when there's announcers and they think the refs made missed a call, they say it. Like, you're allowed to say it. You don't have to like. And they and the crowd boos the refs too. Like, yeah, like, absolutely. Like feverishly in some cases. Like I remember a Chiefs game where they basically booed the refs for like a, the full third and fourth, like the end of the third quarter and the whole fourth quarter. They just never stopped booing. Um, which you don't get that in power. It's a very nice sport. Um, yeah. Alex, what do you, what, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I've seen that. I, I have seen like cases of that, but um, especially with Ryan uh, Lapidat and Joe, who usually commentate worlds. I think they're always commentating worlds and they both commentate Sheffield. Like you could hear the difference. And I love their, they just interact so well. And like the difference of them, because you know, their, their voice change and just like Ryan's like, Oh, I don't know about that lift. Like he does have that, um, I guess that judgment and he like speaks about it. Like with Gavin's third squat um, at Sheffield, he, they're just like, Oh, I don't know. Like, let's see another angle or let's see what the, you know, like, I guess you could say, like, Oh, let's see what the judges say. Cause you guess you just don't know. But also that he's like, Oh, I don't know. They look high. Like you could even bring in pa like past uh, performances. Like this was three reds in 2022 South Africa. Like, will it be three reds again? You know, like saying stuff like that will just be like, you know, getting the, the viewers on their feet. Like, Oh, is it actually going to pass? Like, where's the jury going to get overturned? You know, is the jury going to get in? I mean, yeah, it's all about what the commentators make of it and, you know, having their own like personalities, like, you know, for UFC where you have like Joe Rogan and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Julia, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, yeah, I, I would prefer um, the commentators to be honest about what they think. Um, I think it's a little more exciting. I understand why they're not, I mean, we are not a professional sport yet. Um, these lifters aren't paid to be there. Um, they are still doing this for fun. And so it, it can be a little bit um, alarming um, to have people, you know, speak about you in certain ways. But um, I think that that is important to move the sport forward. Um, that being said, I have been in like kind of a situation like that myself, which I, I can tell you guys about later. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that is, you know, honest commentary, hard hitting commentary is going to be essential because you can't really be analytical and, and kind of toe the line of, um, you know, what's acceptable. You have to, you, you really have to um, dig into it and you have to ask the hard hitting questions and you have to say um, the things that are on everyone's mind for it to be compelling. You know, there's people complain about, um, like I remember like for years, nationals, people would just complain about the live streams because they would just get anyone to commentate. Um, they wouldn't know anything about the sport. Um, they wouldn't really explain anything about the sport. They wouldn't say anything meaningful. Um, they'd say, you know, very kind of, weird things about the lifters. Um, and that really does hold it back. That really does 
not make it a spectator sport because, you know, you can have a lot of people in the arena, like at Sheffield, but in reality, like a lot, most people are going to be watching a live stream. They're not going to be there. Um, So it's very, very important that you have people who know what they're talking about, who are able to explain everything and who aren't afraid to say um, what they're feeling and don't, and don't feel like they're going to be held back by any, you know, penalty from a federation or, um, you know, whatever. And I think that even goes with being critical of the refs and being critical yeah. of the calls as well, because you see that in any other sport, they're like, uh, I don't know about that one. That wasn't a good, that wasn't a very good call. They're not going to be like, wow, that ref is an idiot. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't need to go that far, but you can at least say, look, Mike Gold is like, <laughs> yeah, that's what he wants to hear. But I mean, it, no, no, it, I you want, should I, at least in a nice way say, to do that. I don't you should be able to, no, we're talking commentators. They shouldn't right. feel scared that there's going to get repercussions. Even us on yeah. this podcast should not feel like we have to second guess ourselves from saying something that is an honest thought that's out there in our minds and in other people's minds about, you know, the IPF or Poverty America or any of the other federations out there. You know, it's like we should be able to, um, you know, have that open dialogue about things. That's how you progress. That's how you 100%. make it better. Um, Mike, just, yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead, Julia. Can I just say one thing? Because actually, when we were talking about worlds, I was a few weeks out from NAPF and I was so scared that someone was going to listen to this and like send it to some judge, you know, and they were going to have it out for me. Um, I, I was legitimately scared because you never know, you know, things like that have happened, um, which we can uh, talk about again off the podcast but i mean um... Del- delaney <laughs> with the 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 showmanship and then having you know at least the vibe be that that the refs didn't like that whether that's true or not true whether they like dancing or they don't like oh, no, dancing it, it wasn't refs there was one specific ref the head ref yeah. for delaney was yeah. also the uh strictest most obnoxious ref in the entire competition oh. All the sessions. I heard she's also the nicest person, FYI. She so might be. Let's put, let's not say she's something not a nice person, but I'm yeah, talking yeah. about as a pure ref. She was yeah, also yeah. the ref that got, it was the same, she was also the jury member that got Bonica's uh, deadlift overturned. She she was just, as a pure ref jury, she yeah. was just obnoxious. I'm Mike Gold is creating the world, Mike Gold is creating the world he wants to see. But you're going to see that in a lot of sports. You're going to see that. Like in soccer, 100%. there's, um, there's going to be like some refs that, the players when you know the top players like Barcelona versus Real Madrid and they have a certain rep like they're he's just gonna be handing out yellow cards throughout the entire game and like calls that are just gonna go one way or the other like there's always gonna be that in the sport and I think we just have to get over that and just adapt and just like it's always gonna be within the sport and I think it's honestly a good thing in powerlifting that it's in the sport um but as long as it's equal that's the biggest thing as long as it goes um for everyone in both in every single way possible oh my god I've heard uh NFL coaches and players and NBA players, especially absolutely chew out a ref or, yeah. or an official in a game. And like, like, and you have to be able to do it with, without fear of reprisal in the, in the sense of like, yes, if you say something absolutely inappropriate, you get a technical foul in basketball, you know, you might yeah. get an unsportsmanlike call, but if you're just arguing the merits of the play, like you've heard, you've seen coaches just chewing out refs, screaming at them about the merits of the play and they cannot, you know, they absolutely we can't be have fear of reprisal on both sides. Everybody needs to get thicker skin. This is a sport. It's an entertainment. It's, it's something that yeah. people watch for leisure and entertainment. It has to be compelling. It has to be entertaining. It can't be like just watching a bunch of people saying nice things about each other. Like that's not ever going to be that compelling, you know? Um, and on the referee side, the Federation sides, they got to get thicker skin. They got to be willing to take criticism. Um, they got to let it roll off. Just like you see some of these refs, like get chewed out by like LeBron, who's the biggest superstar in the world. And then they got to go keep continue doing their job. Um, But then the same thing on the lifters and the athletes is like, you know, you, you gotta be ready for someone to come and put a mic and a, and a camera in your face after a tough loss. You can't just run and hide. It's like in other sports, we were just talking about this. I'm a huge Bud Crawford fan and he absolutely beat the shit out of Errol Spence. Like it was a devastating loss, which everyone thought Errol Spence was like, you know, he had, three of the belts and, and Bud only had one and everyone thought it was going to be a close fight. No Vegas odds were like 50, 50 or whatever. And he got dominated. They still came up to him afterwards in the ring and, and do the three minute interview that they do with the winner and the loser. He can't even talk. His face is like <laughs> all puffed up. He can't even formulate a thought. His brain is like not working. And, and yet they still have to do the interview. And then he still had yeah. to do a full on press conference 30 minutes later when his brain was still not working and his yeah. face was still completely bu- messed it up. Um, so for us in our sport, it's so easy. Like you, you, you're just lifting, like, unless you have a broken yeah, leg or so something, easy. 
Like, so, like you, you, you're not I, too busted that you can't talk or formulate a thought. And I, have agree. A press conference. I agree with Petrie on this, but yeah. I thought it over. And the problem here is in like UFC or NFL or NBA when they're required like press conferences. So they're all paid by the sport yeah. and that's a yeah. requirement. So the people doing it are people that work for a sport they're paid for. The problem here is that since the lifters aren't necessarily aren't like paid by a federation or whatever, they're actually paying, by the way, to go to the right, right. No, so right. I'm saying what I mean is, so the, where the problem comes is that unlike where the UFC, like you have a UFC announcer and like he doesn't care if the if the fighter's upset because the fighter the fighters got to fight either way. Here, like the people that would have to ask the tough questions potentially don't want to necessarily burn bridges. So I think in general, mm-hmm. power in uh, people in general are not confrontational, and then yeah. especially in powerlifting. You have a lot of people who are afraid to either make a hot take or afraid to say things that have to be said. Now, when it's a combination of saying something that's like not going to be received well, but also to like somebody who's like a superstar that you don't want, like I'll admit myself, right? I I think that powerlifting media is too soft. But then again, I also didn't want to go interview Taylor after he lost. Like I didn't want to. So I'm admitting I was being soft. I, did. I was, I was, I was pressing him and I was pressing uh, Jason to do it. I was pressing Jason to do it because I, and I was even saying exactly this, like, you know, LeBron has to still go talk after he loses a tough loss. Tom Brady, when he loses a Super Bowl, still got to go do it. Mahomes after losing that Super Bowl still has to go give their press conference, but you're right. They're paid. Our athletes no, so are not, but, it's and, not I, and, it's and not it was smart. I, and in the end, I am, I am Jason advocated for his athlete. He made the smart call because Taylor, to his own admission on when he went on King of List and to me privately as well. And Jason said it to me privately as well. It's just, they would have said something out of pocket and that he would have regretted later. And then, but that's the thing where it's like, you know, we got to be better than that though. We got to be able to, to go and control our emotions and give a press conference and no, yeah. not go out of pocket and just say, no, I'm just here. Athletes, so I don't get all fine. The time, athletes all the time say things out of pocket in like, yeah. I think that's the problem is we're looking at it the wrong way. Good we're point. looking at it like, like obviously in a way athletes are role models this that but like we're also looking at it as like they're they're humans and they're humans after like some big after like a big event happened after like a heartbreaking loss this that whatever yeah it's normal like if you watch like athlete press conferences like most people don't necessarily watch the regular ones you know which ones go go viral that happens all the time the ones where people say things out of pocket exactly it happens. yeah I'm not saying it's ideal maybe they shouldn't do it but it's we have to realize it's normal that's a normal thing to yeah. happen. The emotions but, are running hot. It's, it's normal. And if anyone yeah. understands that, it's Taylor. I mean, he's an athlete. Go ahead, Julia. Um, I mean, that's also something that Ryan was saying on King of the Lifts is that he he gives athletes a lot of leeway in oh, expressing yeah. himself because um, he knows that this matters. He said, um, this was on the Petrie podcast, you know, the highs are really high and the lows are really lows because um, people – you know, they pile on, you know, when you, when you win, it's great. But when you lose, you know, they're, they go yeah. after kind of like what we saw with, with Petrie and Russ, um, you know, last year. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, athletes do, do um, say things out of pocket all the time. And I, I, to be honest, I think it would be good for um, the fans to see that a little bit, because I, I think it would make the athletes a little bit more relatable. Yeah. Um, I've just seen so many comments on Instagram on, on athletes pages where like people are like poking at them and they like, don't think that they're real people. And they're like, you know, like, Oh my God, Taylor responded to me. And it's like, yeah, he's a real person, <laughs> you know? Um, and you should be able to, to see that, that, that should be, you know, that's, that's part of, um, being an athlete. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of the sport is they're not just like that their, their lifting is not the only aspect of their identity. So, um, you know, I think that would be great. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe it, it, you know, there could be some controversy in the beginning, but I don't, I don't think that anyone is going to be, you know, severely negatively impacted. I think people's memories are short and they'll just be, you know, on to the yeah. next thing. That happens. On to Cincinnati to quote a famous press conference. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, 
that's definitely what we want to get to. And I think that's the thing is that we're breaking new ground with this kind of stuff. It hasn't really been done in powerlifting. So I don't think some of our athletes come from other sports and they know this is just standard. Some of our athletes are like big sports fans. They listen to other sports podcasts. They see people shred each other over comments made in press conferences in the heat of the moment. And they know that you get a, a little bit of grace with that too, because it is the heat of the moment. But a lot of our athletes um, don't come from those kind of backgrounds and like don't have uh, uh, very much experience with other sports in the way it's done. So it's just kind of come across as like, we're ruffling feathers by, by like trying to ask someone who just lost a heartbreaking loss to do a press conference. Like we're trying to rub it in their face or something. It's like, no, we're just trying to do basically what you would expect to see in any other sport and to humanize you to show you yeah. that exactly that. Like you're not a machine and that you have feelings and emotions and things like this. So um, I think it's good. I mean, obviously we're going to keep pushing the envelope. I think the, yeah. the more you do have relationships, but every journalist has a story, you know, has a responsibility to tell the truth and to tell it like it really is. And at the same time, try to still keep those relationships and to be able to be like, listen, you know, we're going to do this press conference. I'm going to ask you tough questions. It's nothing personal. You know, it's not about me digging at you. These are the questions that people want to know. Like Mike Gold, you did a really good job of saying that everybody wants to know. It's kind of like, Hey, don't blame me for this question. Exactly. I'm just voicing what everyone else is thinking. Um, so and that's my responsibility. There, I don't think there are enough people that are willing to ask those kind of questions though. Like, yeah, but let's I see. We got two like, of them. We I listen to a ton them. of powerlifting content. I listen to plenty of interviews, this, that podcast. Yeah. I think in general, there aren't enough people who are willing to ask questions that will make the other person upset. Yeah, I, for sure. That, yeah. So what? You got to be that guy. Yeah, I, I have mean, an issue with it. I, I'm saying I couldn't care less, but I'm saying, but most uh, people like don't want to burn bridges. Like I don't care. It's, it's tough on yeah. an interview style podcast versus a press conference. I think in no, a press conference you're expecting yeah, yeah, yeah. everything. Right, everything has its own setting. Right, not everything should be discussed the same way. But I'm saying to do to for what Petrie's saying yeah. with these like interviews, especially like post game yeah. ones with like losing people. Yeah. You can't like just go and say, "Oh, how did it feel to lose?" Like. That's just no, like a no. lame question. You have to like, no, these are you, have to like go, you have to go hard. Like Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, um it's I, I th so so for instance, he he mentioned that you know he wanted to hear Gavin um and and he wanted to hear his reaction after missing the squat. And boom, I went and shared the story highlight from Malta that we have up still to this day. Um, I interviewed him in the warm-up room and put it on our story right after he missed the third squat. So you yeah. get to see emotional Gavin. And then he's like, yeah, but then at that point, he thought that he was still maybe had a chance to win. I want to see after he took the L. Boom, we did the press conference as well. It's right, it's up on our YouTube channel under live. You can go see it. And and we did interview him and we did ask tough, and he did get into it. And like, Mike, you were there, I, I believe. And I was, you know, we asked tough questions. Not super tough. Obviously, I'm, I'm a huge fan of all these people. That was the that was the one I wasn't there for. It was the one you weren't there, but he he talked a lot about it. Like he's he's he, Gavin is not scared to talk after a loss. That's for sure. So 100%. Um, so he's a good one. He's a good example. We did that. Um, any other thoughts on this, Alex? Before we hit up some of these things in the chat. Okay, go ahead, Mike. What were you gonna say? Yeah, I'm saying like it's got to be to the point. Like, I mean, this is not for the U.S. specifically, but like somebody's got to go to microphone immediately after the third deadlift and go to Jod and say. What do you think about your coaches making you lose the world championship by putting in the wrong number? Like, no skirting around like, directly, something like that. Or like, like the same way I asked Brian's coach, right? By saying, why did you put in that attempt for your second deadlift, which cost Brian the world championship? Yes. Like something you have to ask that. That's it. Like, like I know, like, obviously his coach is not happy about it. He made a mistake or but like, you got to directly ask that. Not like, oh, whatever, like skirt around. No, directly. Like, yeah. how did you screw yeah. up here? We need Michael. We need Matt Gary to ask these hard questions. All right, Alex, what's your take? Yeah, hundred percent. No, I mean he's very. Uh, that would be a perfect person to do that. Because I remember in um at Open Nationals, he was. We were doing the press conferences at Open, yeah. and yeah, he was he was asking some like tough questions after like, oh, like your day didn't go the best that you know it you wanted to do. Like, why didn't it do that? And what was yeah. your why did your third squad look like that? And you know what? He said, yeah, that's a that's a perfect person. But yeah, I mean it definitely should be incorporated more into the sport. It's a Hundred percent. I need it needs to be harder. It needs to be more hardcore, and just to like create that fan base that people really want to know, and it just interacts with that person more. You know, it, you really get into the mind of that person. You could sympathize with that person, and you know, you just and at the end of the day, we're all humans. You know, and like after like LeBron loses, and like you hearing like LeBron's just like, you know, it's not my day. Like you know, God has a plan for me and stuff like that. You know, it just it's nice to have 
you know, people say like that and just not everything goes their way um, all the time. It's nice to get those moments captured and yeah, for sure. Just like ask those hard questions that need to be asked and it needs to be, it's probably the next step in the sport of power thing that we need to do. It's interesting because I think a lot of people, you know, who kind of maybe are newer to the sport or just, just in general, people want more flash and glitter. This stuff is not like necessarily sexy stuff. This is not like high production level. This is just like after, I mean, and this is one of the crazy things I see because I've followed and covered uh, Nebraska football for so long. Sometimes it's just a guy in a hallway with a phone asking a yeah. question, like literally after the game, like asking a tough questions, like, like cornering a player and asking them this, this tough stuff. And it doesn't have to be in front of a, a video wall or have strobe lights or any, like that isn't the thing. Yeah. It's the storylines are what are going to carry the sport forward. And we have to use basically <laughs> standard press journalism tactics in order to get those stories out like tried and true formula all right yep. um last thing um if unless julia is there anything final you want to add to that or you give it to okay so let's go to let's go to the uh chat here um we got just a couple things um jordan asked how do we make powerlifting broadcast easier to understand for a general audience like how scoring works what determines lifter order etc they did a cool thing with that in malta uh, yeah. In between, they showed you these great videos um, uh, with with Turbo Tiff and Panna that were like, what what uh, counts as a squad and bench press and things like that. I think more stuff like that would be good. Um, again, like longer pregame shows where you could have a 15 minute video that basically just explains the whole rules of the sport. You play that at the beginning or you play that in the middle so that Mike and I could take a break, you know, and like have a little 15 minute uh, break for us. Um, and uh, Mike Garazzo is in here. He's saying, I think the live stream could show more weights and pounds. That would be more relatable for us Americans. Um, and the announcers mention it, but it should just be part of the broadcast. It wouldn't be that hard. And then uh, JW wrench says, yeah, Bryce Lewis came up with something interesting on that. That's true. We can definitely elevate the broadcast. I mean, even Sheffield, like it, it looked great, but like, we're so far, we're like light years away from football and football has to cover like, whatever it is, 24 guys, uh, or 22 guys out on the field, the refs, the calls, different angles, like throws, catches, runs, like tracking the ball in the air. We just got to cover like a nine foot by nine foot square. It's really not yeah. that complicated. Like, I really think that our, our live broadcasts just are leaving so much on the table. Like, I, I just think when we look back, even at this Malta, which was good, like the, the, the live, or we look at back at Sheffield one and we look at the broadcast just in a matter of years, we're going to look back on those broadcasts and think they were just like so basic in comparison. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of different angles. We're going to see like the lifters coming out. Like there's going to be just a lot more camera guys. Cause there's just, you see at the football game, soccer game, so many camera people, the angles switching, you know, all the time. And there's always that. They always have like those specific angles, like right before the football, right before football play, they have that just one angle, of just like that shot. Um, yeah. And then right before, like, and then in soccer, like when it pans out, like you see the entire field and then it zooms in when like a player gets the ball, like when Messi gets the ball or Cristiano Ronaldo gets the ball, it zooms in on him. You know, it really, you know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to elevate. I definitely could, you know, for sure see that. It just takes a lot of just growing the sport, getting more people into the sport. And then just like, yeah, a lot of like videography and just, you know, more people in that realm, you know, getting different angles of the lifter in the back room, like sniffing the salts in the back room, like, you know, not yeah. hiding that. Cause I feel like also because the sport is kind of soft. I remember going to powerlifting meets and you couldn't, you know, you couldn't even get that on film. They're like, Oh, still. make sure you sniff ammonia behind the back. I'm like, what, what, what's the point of that? Like that's show still, that raw emotion that's there. Yeah. You know, it's still like so, that. I mean, you see, you see other athletes like slapping each other up and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like that was so hype when, when Ben was slapping the shit out of lane and I was getting fired up and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is literally going to be me in two weeks. Yeah. Mike, any final thoughts? I know you got to bounce. No, nah, I, I think we basically covered it. We just, I think all that, like the video and all that stuff's great. And we are doing a better job. Like SPD had a billion different angles at Sheffield. Yeah. I mean, at Sheffield, at Worlds. Um, that was not, and that was great at, at Sheffield too, with like the, you know, the zooming in on Gavin. I love that, obviously, the angle with Gavin and Keiko. But, you know. And the platform yeah. production was great at Sheffield too. Like yeah. the, the video yeah. walls were not like obnoxious. They were really cool. Um, they did a lot of things really good, but like, you know, little things like Noemi's coming out and the French are going crazy and there's no crowd shot. Like, like, you know, yeah. like that's a standard thing in football. Like you're always, you see the fan, like, just like dying after the team is down like 28 to zero, you know, and like they always show yeah. those kind of clips or, or when it's tight, they show the like nervous person, you know, it's like, it's just so many little things like this to like make the sport more compelling. That are just little things like we already got cameras there. Just 
turn one, you know, it's like simple, yeah. simple little things. If you watch sports. Yeah, I um actually I I think it was on King of the Lifts where um someone was talking about how I believe it was uh Brittany Schlater um and um oh my gosh the Belgian Sonita. girl Sonita, Sonita. And Sonita was crying and and Brittany went over to her and was like you know trying to console her or something that was like me that. telling you the story and the, oh, and the yeah, moral was- of the story the moral of the story was nobody was photographing or filming it right um, yeah. It- or, or how did they not get on video when, uh, when, when, um, Callie ran into the, into the stands? Like yeah, the exactly. whole, yeah. Everyone jumped over, everyone, everyone jumped through the, like the ropes and everyone. How, how do you miss that? Like, yeah. They, and they're holding people back and everything and like, yeah. so they don't go to the platform and so on. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Go ahead, Julia, though. Keep finish, that, finish, like, finish your thought. Oh, no, no, that, yeah, no, that's it. I mean, like, these are the things that, that like, you want to capture i mean you know or someone hitting a lift and celebrating the back room or maybe you know um like for example with the 83s um when um anna missed his last deadlift you could you know have have um a camera on delaney 100 yeah like i mean that's that's what we need i mean that just the raw emotion to show people that this isn't just you know um we just like pick up a weight and put it down and do a golf clap and kind of like, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not trying to be um, Olympic weightlifting here. Like, yeah, this is different. We have our own identity. No, as well. No one watches Olympic weightlifting, honestly. Like it's not, as yeah. I mean, it's like, it's so boring. Um, I mean, just honestly, you can't, even golf is the production in golf is insanely light years ahead of, of like so many other sports because they make it exciting. They show you all these highlights. There's all these cuts. They're covering an 18 hole course. That's like, again we're covering nine foot by nine foot and like maybe a warm-up room um yeah but yeah just like little things like sideline reporters you know that you can go to where they could cut back and be like hey like we just talked to gavin in the warm-up room and like here's what happened he like dive bombed that squat and he's gonna try and correct it on the next one you know like i'm overhearing what he's saying i could you could easily come to me and be like and i or i could just be in ryan's ear and be like telling him this stuff you know those little things like this simple yeah i want an elevator cam at sheffield you know, like I want to see people coming up the <laughs> elevator. I want to, yeah. I want to walk through of what the warm up rooms are like and where they have to walk to go to get to the elevator, then where they're going to go after that and where the scoring table is. We don't have any of that. We just kind of see like what they show from the side of the stage, you know, and you kind of get a sense of it, but like an elevator cam to be like, Holy shit, here comes Jesus. You know what I mean? Um, like yeah. we talked Mike gold. Um, we like to start our pregame shows like right after weigh-ins because that's like breaking news. Holy shit. Evie weighed in at 52. Like, what does this mean? This changes everything. Like, let's, let's break it down. Let's have Matt Gary and, um, you know, um, someone other smart people like Sophia Ellis, like sitting there talking about that, like what, it, what that means for the rest Huge of the day. Opportunity. Like Huge. That, and, especially Sheffield with its unique scoring system. The fact that there's no pregame show, like discussing it is like, it's such a big, like wasted opportunity. It, absolutely. because other generally you don't have like 16 people or 12 people battling, right? Like whatever here they're all battling against each other and it's so unique. So there's so, it, such a missed opportunity not to have like, and even during the competition, like they, they said how things are going, but like there was no, like no really real analysis at all. Like, yeah. And then again, so, like I, I got to give credit to like Eric Helms and Omar Isoff on the iron culture podcast. You know, they're like, after you hand chef, uh, Jesus his, his trophy, like, put a mic up there and ask him a couple questions in front of the crowd. Like they do it at yeah. UFC. They do it at boxing. They do it at formula one. They have walk-off interviews in NFL and NBA. The coaches give interviews at halftime. I mean, it's just like, there's so much out there that we could do, but anyway, all right. Obviously we can come up with way more brainstorms, but the whole point was if you listen to the Brandon Petrie podcast on King of the lifts, there's a lot of great ideas in there. Some of the stuff we've started scratching the surface on that we're kind of doing in our own little world over here with power in America. But we, we need this stuff to go more viral. And I would, the last thing I would say is just like, I don't even like the phrase live stream. I want it to be broadcast. Like live yeah. stream sounds like a freaking webcam or something. Like you're going to put a camera over there and turn it on. And, and it sounds like 1995 or something like it just, that's, it's not a live stream. It's a broadcast. We need to think of it like a broadcast where there's a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, and it's like, yeah. um, and there's production involved. Like it's not just a, a camera that you flip on when the, when the competition starts and you flip it off after you hand Jesus his trophy. Um, so yeah, anyway, 
those are our thoughts. Hopefully people will hear this and be inspired and want to go do this. Like do it at a local meet, do it at nationals. Like if, if we can do it at nationals, we're going to do it at nationals. Obviously there's some uh, obligations and stuff with, with our, our live stream and whatnot, but um, hopefully at some point, if, if I ever have a total control over our live stream, we're going to do all this kind of stuff for sure. But all right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, shout out again to Tristan Nasal Rod, 120 kilo national champ and now reigning uh, North American champ. Shout out to Alex Sador. Thanks for coming down and, and giving us your insights on the juniors and sub juniors. Um, Cause I know you got a lot. We'll be talking to you a lot more in Romania, these kind of things, sure. pre pregame shows after and before, like if it's a few en en far enough days in advance, we'll get, try to get you on there, you know, like oh, maybe course, during yeah. one of the first few days or maybe even on one of the uh, equip days. Um, if yeah. you're there a week early, we could, we could do some, have yeah. you on camera. Get me get me right off the plane get me like as i'm in the plane seat yeah yeah dude i mean you guys gotta film your whole stories i i don't know if i'm on the same yeah. flight but if i am i'll definitely be filming the shit out of you guys um yeah absolutely and solid broadcast uh, jordan is saying thanks for calling it a, a broadcast for sure um <laughs> and then of course to um our co-hosts here our leaders in charge of all of this uh mike gold and julia williams julia just got back from a grueling week of work um and hanging out in the cayman islands and um and also just travel back and forth was tough and obviously she balled out and won her weight class by like 30 kilos or whatever it was um and then mike um thanks as always for what you do for us and always pushing the envelope for us so appreciate you and appreciate everyone that listens to the power of the america podcast this is monday night live on a tuesday um next week we're gonna we gotta talk about this we're maybe we'll do it on sunday before i fly to romania i'm flying to romania on monday so can't do it on monday again or else maybe we do it on tuesday again from romania um who knows we'll talk it over we'll post it on our instagram story at least like six hours in advance <laughs> if not 24 if we could do 24 we will um travel in cayman islands really threw a wrench into a lot of stuff it was it was tough but anyway um that's it for tonight thank you again and um we'll catch you all next time Peace.